It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. And this is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief. The ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Somebody shout, it's Friday. Stock futures here ticking slightly higher this morning after ending Thursday's trading session in the red. But Wall Street set to end this week on a high note, perhaps. We're mixed right now. And let's see if we can get another consecutive weekly win within reach here at this point, at least. And the real action this week has been in the bond market. Take a look at the 10-year yield spiking yesterday, just moving to the upside today. This coming on the heels of that hotter-than-expected inflation print before the bell yesterday. And that's prompting traders to push off their rate cut bets. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Ines Bray, and Alexander Canal have more. Yeah, Shauna, futures muted this morning after a busy week filled with economic data. Stocks are tentatively set to recover from Thursday's losses, driven by another hotter-than-expected inflation report. Wholesale prices spooking investors into rethinking bets on a June interest rate cut. And with no big data releases today, investors are turning to February's PCE report, aka the Fed's preferred inflation measure, for more clarity on the timing of interest rate cuts. Plus, Bitcoin extending its sell-off in Friday morning trading. The price of Bitcoin retreating from its record high as concerns over rising inflation weigh on the world's largest cryptocurrency. Bitcoin currently falling below 68000 And technical troubles at McDonald's. The burger giant said on Friday a tech outage disrupted operations at many of its outlets worldwide, including regions in Japan, the UK, and Australia. The system failure shut down some restaurants for hours, resulting in online complaints from customers across the globe. McDonald's says the issue is now being resolved. Let's get to our top story of the day and the move that we're seeing in the stock market and in the bond market. Taking a look at the futures, not seeing much of a change. The real story is going on in the bond market here and taking a look at yields. We're seeing a bit of a move to the upside here. The 10-year yield coming off its biggest one-day spike that we've seen in just about a month. And we are pushing even higher today. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer is here at the desk with us. And Josh, what's really driving the action is the fact that traders, once again, may be pushing out the first rate cut. We're debating June now. Yeah. It was like a month ago we were debating March, it feels like, just right? We, we just keep, every, we just keep pushing weeks, it back. Yeah. It's almost like maybe the cut isn't coming. I mean, we can get there. We can get there. But it's been, a whole sell <laughs> it's, been inter- it's been interesting to just see that debate get pushed out. And, of course, we're talking about a Federal Reserve interest rate cut in June here, hotter than expected inflation data throughout this week and really the last couple weeks, pushing that back. It's been interesting to watch that debate play out thus far. Uh, Looking at the CME Fed futures, we now see the investors betting a 40% chance that rates are held steady in June. To give you perspective, a month ago, there was an 18% chance that rates were held steady. So a significant move to basically create an argument here that maybe we don't get a cut in June. Maybe the cut comes in July. And of course, this all coming a week before we have the dot plot, right? And the dot plot is going to give us a little bit more of a clear picture of where the Fed sees itself going this year. And and so all that considered, I mean, one of the huge things that we kind of look back to that the Fed in its data dependency right now is trying to do is look at this backwards looking data, this lagging Mm -hmm. data, and try to best position its own kind of policy pathway at this juncture. Does it seem from the economists that we've heard from like they're seeing more of a trend be locked in that the Fed can hang its hat on at this juncture. Yeah, I think largely, Brad, most economists are still in the camp of the trend is down, right? And that is why most people still have three cuts priced in this year. They're still looking at June, maybe July. And that's because that's where they feel like the overall trend still is. You notice a lot of people taking data points, different data points from these inflation prints to be gotten, spinning it forward to the Fed's preferred gauge, which is PCE. We don't get that until after this meeting. But in general, people think core PCE is something that is still going to be coming down. Mm -hmm. So that part of the path maybe hasn't changed as much. But at some point, 
they also thought that inflation was going to be falling steady throughout the whole start of this year, right? And that hasn't quite happened either. So I think perhaps more data for everyone, not just the Fed who wants more confidence in the data. Maybe we all need a little bit more data at this point to get a little bit more clarity. Uh, it depends upon the data you want to look at. The Fed knows what data it wants to look at. I don't, I don't know. Uh, if you ask Kathy Wood, she would probably still make the case that the Fed should be looking elsewhere. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for joining yeah. us here, Josh. Appreciate it. Well, it kicks off today's conversation as we're tracking futures. Little change this morning. Looking to end the week on a positive note as investors rethink the likelihood of a June rate cut following more sticky inflation data. Now all eyes turn to the Fed meeting on deck. That's next week. For more on this, we're joined by Tim Aronowitz, who is the innovation or Innovator Capital Management Head of Research and Investment Strategy, joining us now. All right, so Tim, you just heard the setup coming into this next meeting. What do you anticipate will be the prevailing thought among the FOMC members? Well, Greg, coming into this year in our 2024 outlook, our call was for no interest rate cuts this year. That was a very unpopular view back then. It remains an unpopular view today. But the evidence coming out, we think, is, is stronger and stronger to, to support that. And if you look at consensus in the market right now, there's this idea that the inflation battle is done simply for the fact that there's a disconnect between what we're seeing in the inflation data and where uh, you know housing costs are, where rent prices are. And I couldn't disagree with that more. If you look at the, the print that we saw this month, CPI, the average uh, component of that basket rose 30 basis points. If you strip out shelter costs from core services, we saw a 50 basis point increase month over month. That is not something that shows me that this battle is over and it's done. And I think jumping to cuts uh, soon, especially in the first half of this year, would be a mistake on par with the transitory mistake that we made coming into this. So what does that mean then for equity holding? What, what, what does it mean for investors at this point? Well, I think there's there's really strong implications here. The, the, the most notable is that if you look at the correlation between bond yields and equity prices, we have never seen them more negative right now. If you look at the, the, the Russell 2000, S&P 500, very, very negative. And what this comes down to for us is how you're adding protection in the portfolio matters. And the most important thing is that we need to find ways to decouple relying on interest rates to come down to provide protection in the portfolio. Investor psychology has shifted. Uh, bond yields remain the number one driver of equity prices, and that doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. So how we're finding that protection in the portfolio, we need to look outside of traditional risk management tactics like bonds. I guess correlated with the bond yield activity that you're seeing, what are, what are the sectors that are most likely to prevail? Yeah, so you know it, it's all about tech right now, and I think there's there's two driving forces uh, to this market. One uh, is obviously bond yields. The other is all of this hype and excitement around generative AI. What is that going to do? We don't see that trend necessarily slowing down here. Uh, you know, we do think it's you know it's important to get other exposure and be broadly diversified. Absolutely, uh, you know, but for us right now, when we look at you know sectors, it, it's really all about built-in risk management and known levels of risk management in your in your portfolio here. And again, disconnecting interest rates coming down with relying on low volatility sectors to provide protection or bonds to provide protection. So a lot of investors that we're talking to right now are gravitating towards strategies like managed floor ETFs, uh, one in our lineup that has been very popular, ticker SFLR, 10% managed floor uh, on US large cap equities. So that is very important. Also seeing a lot of interest in buffer or risk managed ETFs. And I think the main driver of that right now is they don't rely on interest rates having to come down to provide that balance in the portfolio. When you take a look at the leadership that we saw at least last year, early this year, obviously we have started to see a bit of a divergence between a lot of those larger tech names. But the ones though that have been able to hold on and weather this uncertainty, are they going to continue to lead as we do maybe potentially see more of a broadening out? It doesn't look like the trend is, is slowing down anytime soon. And, you know, we are outlining the case for, you know, two possible scenarios here. One, a rational market that we're heading into, which really points toward just lower returns overall for the remainder of this year. But we think there's a very good chance we also could be heading into an irrational market, Jana. Uh, and that really comes down to all of the hype and excitement that we're seeing over AI the infrastructure build out here. And there's a lot of substance behind that, don't get me wrong. But when we look at irrational markets and the formation of, of bubbles, it really comes down to investors just getting way far out ahead of ourselves, extrapolating those cash flows 
far out in, in, into the future. And I think there's a very good case to be being made right now that we're starting to see that formation uh, in the U.S. tech sector overall. All right, always great to get your perspective here. Tim Urbanowitz, Innovator Capital's Management Head of Research and Investment Strategy. Thanks, Tim. Let's take a look at crypto, more specifically Bitcoin. You're looking at a bit of a drop here today, off just about 6%. Now the move lower coming after Bitcoin really led the crypto rally here earlier in the week. We were talking about record highs. The fact that Bitcoin finally breaking above that 72,000 level. Brad, we are seeing a bit of a uh, backing off, not necessarily a massive surprise given the run-up that we've seen in the price of Bitcoin, not only over the last two weeks, but really what we've seen since the start of the year. And that same type of debate that we're having in the equity markets now starting to uh, creep into the crypto markets. We talk about bubble, whether or not Bitcoin is in a bubble. If we're starting to see signs of a bubble, given the fact that this momentum here to the upside hasn't slowed mm -hmm. much. Yeah, uh, Nicholas Panagotsova over at JP Morgan, the managing director there, said when adjusting for volatility, Bitcoin's allocation here in investor portfolios has already outpaced that of gold here, and that is noteworthy for the debate that we've been, of course, long time having about digital gold versus physical gold, which in itself has uh, warranted many conversations given some of the new highs that we've seen gold moving towards. So one of the huge things for Bitcoin specifically is the next events that could potentially come forward and the types of inflows that we're seeing on top of that and the inflows into investor portfolio allocation that we were talking about just a moment ago. And one of the additional things that he highlighted it was a net inflow of $9 billion into Bitcoin ETFs since their inception. So you've got the inflows into ETFs at the same time where there is going to be some of the holders out there that are perhaps going to be able to sell at, and especially if they got in maybe a decade or, you know, five years even ago, they might be able to sell to some of the investment firms or some of the ETF uh, providers or issuers at a much higher price if they are able to put that supply back into the market. And then it's a larger question of from there, what type of event does the halving create? Does that mean even more of a skyrocketing of Bitcoin price? So those just a few of the events. And then uh, elsewhere in the global crypto market cap, it's going to be the Ethereum Ether ETF or Ether ETF and seeing what type of fanfare that adds onto this fire as well. Yeah, there certainly has been more and more talk, it seems like, by the day about an Ethereum ETF. All right, let's move to another big story that we are tracking, and that is McDonald's facing several outages worldwide, but which resulted in store closures for hours, impacting online app ordering as well. You're looking at a move here to the downside for McDonald's, the Dow component. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal joining us with those details. Allie. Yeah, and we're talking global outages here. Mm. Milan, Bangkok, London, Down Detector, which is a website that tracks a lot of these outages, shows that the spike began to happen overnight around 1 a.m., affecting countries and regions in the U.S., U.K., and Australia. McDonald's did respond to the outages in a statement to Yahoo Finance, writing, quote, we are aware of a technology outage which impacted our restaurants. The issue is now being resolved. We thank customers for their patience and apologize for any inconvenience this may have caused. Notably, the issue is not related to a cybersecurity event. So no cyber attack as of now, as of what we know. McDonald's, though, has been heavily relying on its digital channels on online ordering over the past few years, and that's shown up as a big driver of growth in recent quarters. So any outage of this magnitude could affect growth. We've also seen same-store sales come under pressure recently as McDonald's has been hit with the impact of inflation. Now, we've seen tweets from McDonald's Japan, for example, who did refer to the outage as a system failure and that many of its stores were suspending operations and not taking orders as a result. Hong Kong and Taiwan had similar messages on social media. Uh, the fast food chain has about 40,000 restaurants worldwide. It wasn't immediately clear how many restaurants had been affected here. But, you know, it's interesting to think that we saw Meta's Facebook and Instagram face outages earlier mm -hmm. this month. So any technical outage where people don't have access to that website, access to ordering, and you have to result in full-blown closures, mm -hmm. that's not a great thing. So hopefully McDonald's can figure out what exactly happened here. Yeah, I was even taking a look at the McDonald's Japan account and yeah. doing my best to 
try and translate. I mean, <laughs> fortunately, there's a button that I could just hit yes. on there. I was getting grilled by our team, by the way, over the validity of that translation. I don't know. Google <laughs> says it's translated, so I believe it. But at the end of the day, I mean, it, this does come back down to the digital prominence that right. McDonald's is moving to and, and through, actually, at this point, and also the regional basis that they're growing out on. Asia Pacific, amazingly important to getting this right, so it'll be interesting to say what more they have to say about that. Yeah, um, globally, McDonald's has make, been making a big push. We know that they're loyalty programs, which yeah. stems from digital. That's been a really important Ooh. aspect of the company. So, you know, when you affect things like loyalty programs and the access for consumers, they're not going to be too happy about that, and they may decide to go to a competitor. So, luckily, they do seem to be resolving this issue. Stores do seem to be reopening, but they're going to have to figure out exactly why this happened. Yeah. And top trending uh, story here at This Morning in Business News. All right, Ali, thanks so much. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Shares of Ulta sinking pre-market after issuing softer guidance than the street was hoping for. The beauty retailer, the beauty retailer saw heavy promotion eat into margins as cautious consumers continue to pull back on some discretionary purchases. Joining us now on this, we've got Susan Anderson, who is the Kennecord Genuity Managing Director. Susan, great to see you here this morning, and thanks for taking some time here ahead of the opening bell. Uh, you had just boosted your price target, and your buy rating here on the stock maintains. So ultimately, what are you looking at here within Ulta and continuing to look out into the future to, to see some strength? Yeah, so they gave 
you know, pretty good top line guidance for a four to five percent comp, but it was the bottom line that was a little bit light versus where the street was at is some investments that they're making is still weighing on SGNA this year. And then also the promotions are, um, you know, still going up a little bit, still very rational, though nowhere near COVID, you know, pre-COVID levels. So, you know, I think the beauty business still remains very strong and Ultis should benefit from that. Also last year, they didn't have as much newness as they did in the prior year, but this year it sounds like they're going to ramp up that newness again, which should help to keep those sales pretty strong. So, you know, we still feel good about their performance this year and um, potentially, you know, their guidance could prove conservative. Susan, how much do you think the new product lines, the launches that we're expecting here is going to add to Ulta's top line? Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be very helpful. Um, they just recently rolled out Charlotte Tilbury and Sol de Janeiro, which you know are starting to ramp in the stores now. So I think that'll be helpful. And then in the back half, they talked about they have more newness coming out. So I think it, typically newness is about 20 to 30 percent of Ulta sales. Last year, I think that newness was towards the lower end of that range. So this year, I think it's going to be much stronger and it's going to be very important to the sales. You know, it's really interesting. I, I this is perhaps the third or fourth conversation where I've heard this word newness tossed around quite a bit here, and we hear it with some of the athletic footwear and apparel companies especially. What is newness? Is it, is it a result of innovation and research and development that these companies are doing, or is it just a matter of rebranding something that may have been popular that they're looking to resurface again? No, it's really so it could be anywhere from a new brand that they're launching in stores, such as the Charlotte Tilbury, or it could be new products coming from existing brands. So it's kind of all of the above, but it's not necessarily just repackaging or rebranding something that was already there. It's really something that is new that the consumer is looking for that's driving them into that store. Thank goodness, Susan, because I didn't want to be out here getting duped by something that I might have bought yeah. that's already in the closet or in the <laughs> in the bathroom shelf. So thank you for that. Yeah. Sure. Susan, let's talk about the loyalty program. When we mentioned Mount Ulta, especially over the last couple of quarters, we talk a lot about the loyalty program. And once again, this most recent quarter, up just about 7%. Does that mean that maybe some of the fears or concerns that we have heard when it comes to Ulta surrounding a more competitive landscape, that maybe some of those fears are a bit overblown given that strong loyalty base? Yeah, it is interesting. So it's up 7% again this year. Um, the past couple quarters, it was it has kind of strayed from you know, sales. It's been a big driver of sales growth, um, but it seems like it's maybe driving a little bit less. Also, the ticket has been down, and I think that has to do with consumers kind of buying less as well. So even though they're getting more consumers, they're buying less. So that could have something to do with competition as Sephora ramps up their store within store at Kohl's and you know expands their store base as well, because they are seeing some pressure on their prestige categories. Um, you know, it, I think it's still a little bit early to tell, you know, how much share they're actually losing, but it definitely seems like there's some heightened consumer in that prestige area. Um, in mass, though, they do continue to do very well, and the, the business has been very healthy there. I mean, you, you, you cover the businesses that, that smell the best here, and uh, Estee Lauder, the fragrances, you know, I'm speaking with our executive editor because we happen to use something similar of the same cologne. We might have to trade down to, to, to Fierce over at Abercrombie & Fitch. My goodness, these prices are getting yeah. insane here. And, and could that be why consumers are buying less? Yeah, it, it could be. Obviously, they have to pick and choose what they buy because you can't keep buying everything when prices are up 10%, right? So, you know, I think that they are picking and choosing. Typically, though, beauty has been one of the more defensive categories, you know, in weaker macro times. And I think we are seeing that as the category itself continues to do very well. And we do continue to see premiumization. So prestige, um, the industry itself grew faster than mass last year. So while I think consumers are mixing and matching more, so buying more of a mix of mass, mass siege and prestige, the prestige um, business is still doing well. Um, maybe consumers are cutting back more elsewhere in their wallet, but beauty typically does hold up better. All right, Susan Anderson, Kinecourt Genuities and Managing Director, thanks so much for hopping on thanks. with us here this morning. Thanks for having me. Right, let's take a look at another earnings mover here, and that is Adobe Shares are plunging off just about 12%. The company forecasting weaker than expected sales for the current quarter 
First quarter, though, revenue did climb about 11% from year-ago earnings, beating the street's expectations. But the movement to the downside that we're seeing here, Brad, in pre-market trading is because of that guidance that was issued here from the company, raising some concerns, some questions about what AI demand looks like. We know Adobe has started to incorporate AI capabilities within some of their product offerings, Acrobat, Photoshop, Premiere Pro, just some of their products that now have AI features. But when you take a look at what they are expecting to see demand to look like for the current quarter, then looking out for the remainder of the year, there are some questions about maybe there was a bit of too much excitement uh, related to the fact that they are incorporating some of these AI features. The executive team, though, on the earnings call doing the best they can to placate any of those concerns, saying that they are still very optimistic about their AI initiatives and what they think growth is going to look like here in the long run. Yeah, this was a record Q1 for them and on a revenue base specifically, talking about some of the strong momentum. But to your point, it's going to come up against some tough comparable sales here uh, or tough comps in this next year ahead here. Mm -hmm. And especially as you pulled forward so much of or try to now realize as we're firmly in the show me story of generative AI and which companies are talking it versus walking it, for Adobe, it's the matter of how many of their consumers on the outset are early adopters and those that are later kind of laggards or, or eventually get into the adoption cycle, whether they're willing to pay up for what they've already seen be delivered by some of the existing category clients for them. Now, for the digital media segment revenue, that represents about 12% year-over-year growth. That's a critical segment for the company, $3.82 billion, especially when you look at that overall revenue base of $5.18 billion in the first quarter there. Um, and then additionally here, the digital new digital media annualized recurring revenue rate, that was about $432 million. So uh, all things considered, that's going to be a major sector to continue to watch going forward for Adobe. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more ahead. We're just about three minutes until the opening bell on Wall Street. We'll be right back.
And here is the opening bell on Wall Street as we get ready to ring and start the final trading day of the week. And look at that. Lots of excitement playing out on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. The New York Stock Exchange, you got Madison Square Garden ringing the opening bell in honor of and to celebrate the Big East tournament that is happening this weekend at MSG. You can see the mascots up there on the podium. And then you have Jameson on the floor uh, ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ. And can you guys, uh, for the head back to the podium shot, I think it was St. <laughs> John's mascot that was up there, and UConn. The Husky. Villanova Wildcats, they're out of the tournament. All right, Brad Smith is at the Interactive. Closer look at some of this movement that we're seeing, Brad. Yeah, I, I wanted to get tickets to that Big East tournament. They were too expensive. MSG, uh, yeah, that was a, a hefty price there. But fortunately, the Ides of March is a free ticket, just very saucy. All right, take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average right now. Out of the gate, it's down by about a quarter of a percent. The NASDAQ Composite, you're seeing that move to the downside by about half a percent. Let's get some charts on the screen. I heard you like charts, so we're going to load up some charts for you. We'll put this on a five-day move for you just to give you a look at what's transpired over the course of this week here over the past five days eh, yeah net lower by about three tenths of a percent there you can see this week's trading activity and so we'll see exactly where we end out today's trading session for the nasdaq composite the s p 500 past five days by the hair of its chinny chin chin we're going out to the thousands of the percentile there two thousandths of a percent higher over the past five days here today down half a percent and taking a look at the heat map we heard you like heat so here's some street heat for you taking a look at the nasdaq 100 a lot, a lot of red on the screen here it's taking a look at the um, mega cap tech stocks some of those blue chip companies uh, microsoft down a percent amazon out the gate down by about nine tenths of a percent eight tenths of a percent google alphabet whatever you're calling them at home call them in the red they're lower by about four tenths of a percent meta platforms nvidia apple the list goes on you do have some spots of green tesla oh my gosh catching a breather for a day sound off the alarm shoot off the confetti cannons it's up by about 1.1 percent here let's take a look at those sector activities for you and we're going to dive into retail in just a quick moment here we've got more laggards than gainers here energy leading the pack bringing up the caboose you've got technology all right blinding me with science and then just lastly here taking a look at some of those retail names as i promised we're going to get some reads on the consumer just a little bit later on at the top of the 10 with uh the consumer sentiment index that's going to be dropping and here it is retail let's take a look at it just very quickly here Amazon, Walmart in the red. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. Home Depot is in the green here. It's up by about one tenth of a percent. You also got retail sales that were higher for the month of February yesterday, six tenths of a percent. Shauna, toss things back over to you. All right, let's take a look at where things are today. The three major averages. We're looking at a mixed picture, although not too much movement for the Dow, just above the flat line. You got the SP and the NASDAQ, though. Both under pressure today, that hotter than expected inflation print earlier this week, really spooking investors at this point, pushing out maybe the odds of when we will see that first Fed, the first rate cut by the Fed. So let's talk about what this means and how you should play and position your portfolios for that. We want to bring in our guest here. We have Dana Dioria, InvestNet's PMC co-chief investment officer here uh, joining us. Dana, let's talk about the positioning, how investors should be getting ready for the big meeting for, at the Fed next week. What would you make first of the wild trading day or the wild action that we saw in the bond market yesterday and how that sets us up? Well, I do think that, you know, the market is contending with the fact that there's probably not going to be a rate cut as quickly as they hoped. And, you know, it's kind of odd, right? I mean, from the start of the year, I mean, we look back just a couple of months ago, uh, six odd, you know, rate cuts being priced in and, the expectation really didn't make sense with the rest of what was going on with the market, right? You had the Fed at that point saying, hey, higher for longer. You had no sign of a recession coming and you had unemployment staying strong. And really what's happened is not a lot has changed and the market now is, is sort of coming to terms, right? So we have inflation, to your point, you know, ticking up a little bit, PPI, um, core, you know, consumer inflation still kind of not getting under wraps in the way that the Fed would like. I mean, it's not it, it's not going up in obviously any kind of extreme way, but it suggests that it's not also coming down, right? Uh, the, the, it's plateaued a bit and, and kind of staying stickier than wanted. And then, of course, you know, unemployment, unemployment rate ticked up a little bit, uh, but initial jobless claims very low, right, relatively speaking. And, you know, so it looks like the employment market is strong, consumer is strong. Uh, why would the Fed be cutting rates anytime soon? So I know we've heard some dovish things, you know, coming out of the Fed, um, and, and they maybe are going to speak that way about it a little bit. But I think the market is recognizing, hey, look, um, you know, we, we just might not get even three this year. Dana, what are the top pillars to the no-cut playbook for investors? 
I think um, in terms of how you're thinking about it, and, I, and I'm a little, you know, so obviously, uh, typically speaking, if you're not going to get rate cuts, then that should theoretically hurt growth stocks because they have longer dated cash flows. They have to discount back by a higher rate. Uh, what we've seen is that technology, these big growth companies have not flinched, you know, one iota based on what's going on with, you know, interest rate expectations. And that's largely because they're self-funding, right? They have the cash. They don't need to go back to capital markets. Where we've seen the pain kind of felt is small cap arena, which is more interest rate sensitive. And so you'd, you'd think the, the intelligence on that would be, okay, seems like then we should stick with large caps. But remember that the market prices things in very fast, right? And so as it's looking at what, what the potential for rate hikes is throughout the course of the rest of the year, I think you take that longer term uh, look, you look at valuations. I'm still a proponent that at least some you know small cap position, maybe even a little bit of a tilt relative to the fact that, look, you've got a massive amount of mega cap in your portfolio. I don't care if you're passive, you're active, unless they're taking massive tracking error, you've got a lot of mega cap. I still think there's a place for small. I think it just may be a bet you have to ride out a little bit longer. Jenny, you mentioned the fact that we might not get three cuts now between now and year end. What's your base case? And when you talk about the impact it's going to have on equities, what more specifically then does that downside look like? Well, you know, you think about what has the market been thinking about in terms of why these high, you know, why the expectation of rate cuts to begin with, right? And what were the reasons potentially that would even um, rationalize that? Maybe one is that, you know, our federal debt is increasing so dramatically and, and perhaps there was an expectation that the Fed would, you know, want to lower the interest rate costs. I think that's still in the mix. Politics are still in the mix. So I'm arguing a little that, you know, yes, there's some reasons to still think that as long as the Fed feels comfortable that inflation doesn't tick back up, we could see a few more rate cuts. With that, with that whole big thing being a caveat, I would say I think two to three. I, I, I actually lean towards um, the lower end is the base case, though, for all the reasons we've talked about. Dana DeOria, who is the Investnet's PMC co-CIO. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, MasterCard shares hitting an all-time high this week. February retail sales report out this week also suggested consumers are still spending big and credit card companies out there are able to take advantage of that thirst to consume. This, as MasterCard's top competitor, American Express, has added over $18 billion of sales since 2021, according to its newly filed annual report. Yahoo Finance, the first to get access to the chairman and CEO's annual letter to shareholders out Today, in it, Stephen Square emphasizing the company's focus on generative AI to enhance the customer experience. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi. Hey, Brian. Yeah, it was a good read uh, by uh, Stephen Squarey. Uh, really calling out two things for me uh, in going through this letter. One, as you mentioned at the top, Red, uh, a big focus uh, on generative AI inside the company. Steve has formed a team to really think deeply on how Gen A not only will impact how the company functions internally, but how Gen AI will impact that customer or consumer facing experience. And number two, one number that caught my attention going down the release is this year, uh, American Express is supposed to release about 40 new products or improvements on existing products. Last year they did 20, so essentially they're doubling uh, the number of uh, maybe uh, services that are tied to American Express this year. So all that is pretty interesting. Maybe it leads to better results. Overall, uh, Square's letter, uh, of course, Square also told me this on, on general uh, Gen AI, which I thought was uh, very fascinating. Again, more on developing that team uh, this year and then how he thinks about how Gen AI, well, Gen AI will impact that customer uh, experience. I think they're going to be adding a lot of coders inside American Express over the next five to ten years. But again, Square, that's what he's telling uh, me in a, an exclusive conversation. But this all got me going back to look at some of the financials uh, over at American Express. Recently filed annual report. Uh, I love reading annual reports. I know everybody's always fixated on the 8K and the 10Q because they're of the moment. But the, 8, the 10K, the annual report for a company, especially a company, story company like American Express, really gives a good snapshot into how they grow over a longer period of time. And I was really blown away by some numbers here, just zooming out. $18 billion in sales added since 2021. Cash pile up almost $25 billion since 2021. More than a dollar earnings uh, added since 2021. And they added 20 million more cards in force than 2021. That's some big growth numbers uh, for a company that's been around 
at least since 1850. Uh, and then if you're thinking about, and like Brad, you mentioned, uh, American Express just off its record highs. You had Visa trading near its record highs, MasterCard touching an all-time high. If you're an investor and you want to get involved in these stocks, now you want to be thinking about how, they can, how can they deliver up to these high expectations uh, from the street. What else could be added to this card set to further accelerate sales and earnings over the next few years? And then lastly, I know we've gotten some good reads on the consumer here, notably this week. The, maybe the retail sales report wasn't that bad. But can this pace of sales and spending on, on uh, services, can it continue at this rate? One of the biggest growth areas right now, and it has become the biggest growth area for American Express is actually dining within their transit and entertainment uh, side of the business. Can these things continue? Because they have been driving the stock over the past two years unclear to me, but for right now, they seem to be doing pretty well. Yeah, Brian, digging into that last point that you were just making, I think so many people are asking if we do see a bit more of a slowdown, if we're in this higher for longer environment than maybe what the street is forecasting at this point. The pressure that we typically see on names like American Express or names like Visa on MasterCard, how does that stack up to the outperformance that we have seen over the last couple of quarters. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Shona, because I'm also thinking why these stocks are trading near record highs is, yeah, the spending numbers have been good, but they're really being viewed as defensive type plays. The moats around Visa, MasterCard, and American Express is significant. A couple weeks ago, I, I got to spend some time with Visa's new, C, new CEO, and to hear what he's thinking about digital coins and crypto and overseas growth is fascinating, and I can't find a lot of companies that are doing uh, what these three companies are doing, nor is there any chance of any company, at least coming out today, catching any three of these companies over the next 10, 15, 20 years. When you think about that revenue figure, just lastly while we have you, I was looking back to perhaps the best pre-pandemic marker that we have in 2019. And even though we saw that growth that, that you cited a moment ago versus 2021, I mean, it still seems like many of these companies are trying to get these growth numbers lapping mm -hmm. the, the pre-pandemic markers as well, where the revenues in total were, were actually higher than that 2021 figure. That's a good point. I didn't go back to 2020 because it would, I think, show even more just a higher periods of growth. To me, the 2021 to 2023 is a real good snapshot on how these businesses have been doing past pandemic. But to your point, Brad, there is an opportunity to get back to where it was as more, uh, as more just workers, let's say in the case of American Express, come back to offices, there's more entertainment, there's more services they can spend on these corporate cards and they get back to the way they were growing beforehand. But it will take time. I mean, the pandemic has fundamentally changed a lot of companies and these cardholders are one of them. Not everybody is back in the office. Not everybody and, and those back in the office are not spending the way they were as they did pre-pandemic. All right, Zaz, great stuff. Thanks, Thanks for having on set with us. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Shares of discount retailers Dollar Tree and Dollar General under pressure this week after the companies issued troubling guidance in their latest quarterly results. First, Dollar Tree on Wednesday announcing it will close nearly a thousand family dollar stores over the next few years as it battles macroeconomic concerns and theft. Now, on the other hand, you have Dollar General on Thursday, which also warned of higher costs related to more costly labor and shrink. So what does all this mean? for the playbook and how do these companies turn things around? We want to bring Kate McShane, she's Goldman Sachs' managing director covering the U.S. retail sector. Kate, it's great to have you here. So help us make sense of the trends that we're seeing at Dollar Tree and Dollar General, because I think many investors would think that these two names would be positioned to do extremely well at a time like this. So why are we seeing a bit of a disappointment when it comes to the forecast? Well, I think we might have to start just what we've seen so far, which has been a more challenged uh, top line and revenue growth for both retailers as they have uh, experienced um, more pressure from the lower end consumer, which is their core customer. And so because of that, uh, there has been pressure on the top line for them. The lower end consumer, while employed, has been dealing with high inflation uh, and also reduced government benefits. And that has been one of the areas that both discount retailers have been dealing with, along with, on the cost side, uh, quite a bit of shrink, which is um, basically loss of product from stealing and the like at the stores. Uh, when you think about the average prices of just inventory at, at these stores. I mean, it, it feels like we're moving towards $3 tree, $4 tree, uh, upwards of $7 tree. What, in terms of the consumer expectation and, and how the inventory is going to be moved through from Dollar Tree and, and Family Dollar's perspective, what is the real price that in, a consumer should expect when they're going to a dollar store in 2024 now? Yes, it, it really does depend. I mean, you know, starting with Dollar Tree, which uh, until very recently sold most of what it had for a dollar, it broke that buck, uh, which is a term we use. Uh, they broke through the dollar uh, a, a couple of years ago now and are at a dollar twenty-five for a lot of its product. But as you mentioned, they're also adding multi-price points as well, and that's in order to cater more to what their customers need. So there are $3, $4, and $5 price points, especially in, um, uh, you know, uh, bigger items uh, that they can offer their customer. And I think as a result of offering that, Dollar Tree is seeing a higher-end demographic uh, by coming to their store. $125,000 demographic is now shopping at Dollar Tree more so than they were before. Okay, well, what does that tell us then just about promotional environment, promotional activity that we are going to likely see here in the coming quarters? I think from a promotional environment, what most retailers are talking about is a normalized promotional environment. So what that means is, is uh, when people talk about normalized, they talk about uh, levels going back to what we saw before the pandemic. I think you know during the pandemic and post the pandemic, there was quite a, a bit of uh, pullback in promotions just because there was such high demand. I think now that we're in a more normalized environment, the level of promotions that we're going to see across retail will look similar to what we saw uh, before. For the pandemic. When you hear about rewards program from some of the largest retailers, Walmart, Target, that in essence, for some of the deals that they might push through to some of the members of those rewards program could bring prices down for select items comparable to that of a Dollar Tree, uh, a Dollar General. Where does that kind of net out? And does that just become a net benefit to a company in, in Walmart that has sheer scale that is you know, multiples that of a Dollar Tree or Dollar General. There's no question uh, that they're all competitors to each other. And you're certainly right in that we have seen lower price points introduced. It's something that Target talked about at their analyst day last week, where they're uh, focusing on more value price points. And that does get into, you know, a, a more uh, value range uh, in terms of what they're offering, $5, $10, $20. Uh, and it does overlap with uh, the discounters. So it is getting more competitive. The customer is looking looking for value. I think the customer is always looking for value. And you're seeing that focus from um, Walmart and Target and then, you know, just the ongoing focus from the discounters as well. So, Kate, who is the top pick then within the sector? And given the fact that we're going to get the Fed meeting next week and we could hear uh, some language that would point to the fact that we might not see a rate cut anytime soon. 
Yes. Well, our, our our top pick right now is Target. It's on the conviction list here at Goldman Sachs. The idea is, is that Target is lapping some very uh, easy compares from last year. They had some challenges uh, last year in particular uh, in the second quarter, and it's something that, uh, as the consumer, we think gets a little bit healthier throughout 2024. Uh, we could see some resumption of discretionary sales for Target. It's not really dependent on rate cuts necessarily. I think uh, Goldman Sachs' view when it comes to the health of the consumer is pretty uh, solid because uh, the consumer is employed. We are forecasting that the consumer's discretionary cash flow will increase by a low single-digit range this year. Goldman Sachs Managing Director Kate McShane. Kate, thanks so much for taking the time here on this Friday. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Certainly. And everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Rivian shares climbing higher after Piper Sandler upgraded the stock to overweight from neutral and raised their price target from $21 or to $21 from $15. Analysts behind the call writing Rivian could still be risky, but investors can stop fretting so much about cash burn. Now that near-term balance sheet concerns have mostly been addressed, we were taking a look at the stock price reaction here for RIVN. And what you're going to see here today is that the company is up by a little 
more than, well, it was up 4% a moment ago, but right now, three and three quarters percent. Still not shabby. Yeah, Brad, they're excited about the new products. We you know we got the R2 SUV, which got 68,000 orders, according to this note in the first 24 hours. They have the R3, which is also coming uh, down the line. And Piper Sandler making the argument that they at least think it could be one of the most compelling designs on the market when it is released. So pretty strong words there, just in terms of what that could then translate into for demand. And then the second reason is what really caught my attention. Brought up the fact that it's more than just selling cars and made the comparison to Tesla, saying that it's the most compelling when it comes to the fact that it could generate revenue from software and services here going forward. So that would be the differentiating factor, at least in Piper Sandler's eyes, when it comes to Rivian and why you should be more bullish on the stock. A bit of a contrarian call, given the fact that there are still concerns that remain around the cash needs and exactly what the cash burn rate is going to look like. And remember, this is a stock that's still off, what about? 30%, 25%, 30% since issuing its disappointing forecast not too long ago. So Piper Sandler at least making the argument that there's still a lot of reason yeah. to be bullish at this point. I mean, the R2 is still going to be a $45,000 mm -hmm. vehicle. And so on a relative basis, cheaper than some of the $70,000 vehicles that they were putting out originally with the R1. And it's a larger question of how they, in an environment where there have been some severe pricing wars that have initiated, how they can navigate some of the margin pressures that they may face as a result of getting caught up within the decision uh, mindset that many consumers who are perhaps for the first time just getting into an electric vehicle have to figure out on the luxury end, who do they want to purchase from, what kind of scale are they getting in range, and at what price point as well. And so Rivian has continued to be at the top or higher end of that price range. All right, Rivian, a name to watch here in today's trading action. All right, just a few minutes from the top of the hour. Much more on your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Hey, welcome back to Yahoo Finance here on the Ides of March. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're not wearing green. Just realized that. About 30 minutes into the trading day, we do have some green for you, though. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up. This is not where the green's at. S&P 500's down by about six tenths of a percent. Stocks lower this Friday after a busy week of data showed that inflation remains sticky for consumers as well as a wholesale producer environment out there. Also, taking a look at some individual trending tickers here, Macy's dominating, or well, nominating a new director to its board amid a takeover battle with Arc House Management. This comes as the retailer agrees to work on a confidentiality agreement with the private equity firm and its partner that would allow them to conduct due diligence. And shares of the athletic-inspired fashion retailer Hibbit Sports are plunging after reporting fourth quarter sales below analyst expectations. The retailer saw comparable sales fall 6.4% compared to a year ago. The company pointing to the promotional environment, wage increases, and inflation as headwinds. And shares of Groupon sinking after reporting revenue in its fourth quarter, down 7% compared to a year ago. This comes as the company is undergoing a transformation plan to improve financial performance and increase liquidity. And for those out there keeping score at home, this one is also down. So that means there's still some green out there somewhere. It's just not in these movers that we're tracking at the top of the 10 a.m. hour. All right, let's get to some breaking news that we have. The preliminary reading on consumer sentiment coming in below expectations, falling in the month of March to 76.5. That was versus a prior month reading of 76.9. The median estimate was for 77.1. When it comes to some of the commentary within this report, saying that small improvements in personal finances, those were offset by modest declines in expectations for business conditions. Also, long-run inflation expectations remained at 2.9% for the fourth month in a row. Staying within that narrow range that we've seen of 2.9 to 3.1 percent, which it has been in that range in 29 of the last 32 months. So that puts it in perspective. But again, consumer sentiment falling on that month over month basis, the Knicks dropping to 76.5. Yeah, two interesting words that stick out to me from this holding pattern. Consumer views stabilizing into a holding pattern, according to the survey of consumers director Joanne Shu, who has said that consumers perceive few signals that the economy is currently improving or deteriorating. Indeed, many are withholding judgment about the trajectory of the economy at this juncture, particularly the long term here, pending the results of this November's election here. So that an interesting call that I believe is perhaps the first time that we've seen the general election call, at least this year, be weaved into the survey of consumers here. So uh, again, the preliminary reading here, 76.5 uh, for the month of March. Also, everyone, fresh economic data could be giving the Fed more reasons to delay interest rate cuts. The unemployment rate ticked up slightly in February to 3.9 percent, but still remains at a historically low level in general here. That jobs report was followed up by two hotter than expected inflation prints, consumer prices and producer prices both ticking higher in February. Recent data, it's causing investors to pull back on Fed rate cut bets. Our next guest recently adjusted his expectations for the Federal Reserve. Joining us now, we've got Blake Quinn here live in living color, RBC Capital Markets, head of U.S. rates strategy here. We're trying to toss around and, and just make sense of coming into this year, the chats, the commentary was around six to seven cuts maybe. And now we're sitting at what, like zero to three cuts maybe? So what from your purview has changed so significantly and what does this mean for the potential amount of cuts? Yeah, and to be fair, we thought the pricing kind of at the end of the year and into January was probably a little excessive. I think markets uh, got a little ahead of themselves with some comments out of Waller and Powell. I think those were overinterpreted to think that cuts were coming. I think they were just kind of, um, you know, hinting that the conversation was changing towards cuts. They weren't saying, hey, we, we are, you know, asked to do this in, in, by March. Um, you know, we've seen the cutting cycles uh, kicking off in June. Um, we still see it kicking off in June. So I, I think the data that we've gotten hasn't necessarily pushed that back. Where we've seen the change is really in the pace that they're going to go afterwards. Um, you know, I think the improvement that we've already seen on the inflation side of the picture is enough uh, to give the Fed uh, some reason to start pulling back on rates, particularly when you think of things from a real rate perspective, just given inflation has fallen. Uh, you know, those real rates are, are tighter just because the inflation component has gone down. So I think that's enough for them to start the process. But when you have labor market data and growth data so resilient, I think it really takes away the urgency to, to move rates, uh, you know, more quickly. So that's why we've gone from that five cut scenario where they were cutting every meeting after June to every other meeting where it's really just three. So what does that then tell us just about the action that we're likely going to see within the bond market? Because taking a look at the massive sell-off that we got yesterday, yield spiking higher. Is, is there much more room then to the upside, do you think, for yields? 
I think we're pretty well priced, to be honest. I mean, we, I still probably uh, am biased towards that short position. I think, um, you know, just talking to investors, uh, I was on the West Coast earlier this week and talking to a lot of investors out there, and I still think there's a desire uh, to lean long into the market. So I think a lot of them are positioned long, and I think if we see, you know, 10-year yield back up to that kind of 430, 450 type of range, there are people there that will support that market. Um, and also, I, I just think um, overall we're in a pretty good place as far as Fed pricing. So. Um, you know, you always do have to think about the balance of risks around the Fed pricing. It's never really that you can look at Fed pricing and say that's exactly what markets are expecting their price. They're always going to be pricing in some risk of a greater slowdown um, that's going to kind of keep those yields from rising too much, in my view. And so as we think about whether or not, you know, the, the number of cuts, given that the estimate has changed now significantly from the start of the year, does that mean that we've seen the Fed or should believe the Fed has been able to pull off a soft landing here? I think the soft landing is consensus. I mean, we, we see the soft landing. I think the real question for us, and, and you know, to be honest with you, when we changed our Fed call, I think there was more interest in how we changed our 2025 figure mm -hmm. than actually our 2024 figure. Because, Where's the 2025 figure? So at? we are now only have two cuts in 24. Um, we're, we're kind of leaning towards, I think, uh, this kind of 94 to 98 type of situation where the markets really did kind of move sideways for a very long time. The Fed cut 75 basis points, uh, you know, just to be cautious several times during that span. Uh, but they would cut 75 and then stay, you know, stay put for, for quite a while after that to see how things to see how things went. I think we could see something similar this time around. So um, I, I think there's been actually more interest in that kind of side of things, how, how it's shaping up in 25 and, um, you know, whether those risks are really, you know, could there be a reacceleration? Could there be another leg of an expansion in 25 or are we going to see more downside risk there? I think there's almost more interest coming in 25 now where that that terminal rate is. Like a very short term question here, but with the Fed meeting next week, we're going to be hearing from Powell. What do you expect, I guess, given the tone that we could hear and what the reaction is going to be uh, within the bond market? So I think everybody's focused on the dots, how many yeah. cuts we're going to show. Um, that's been all the conversations that I've had over the last week uh, around the FOMC meeting. Um, you know, they, they did show three cuts in the December SEP. That's the median dot was at three cuts. Um, there were only two, it, it only takes two people that were on that median dot to move their estimate to pull the median up. So that median is not very well protected. It could move very, very easily. Um, I actually lean towards them moving, uh, moving that to, to two cuts, uh, which I think is a little out of consensus. I think consensus is generally right now for that to stay the same. Uh, a lot of the comments we got uh, in between the January and February uh, CPI data, um, they seem to be kind of writing off the strength in the January CPI data and saying, hey, you know, there's going to be bumps along the way. We're still fine. Three cuts still probably the best uh, guess of where we're going. Um, you know, I, I think they might have been hoping for some relief in the February CPI data. Um, it did not provide it. You know, there was no, I, I really don't think it provided evidence that we can write off January as idiosyncratic or kind of a one-off. Um, so I think they're left with two inflation prints that really don't give them the confidence that they wanted to see. And I, um, you know, I, I think because of that, we only need two people to move. And um, I think that inflation data is going to be enough to tip two of those dots, and we're going to see that medium move to two, in which case I think the markets would react to that uh, relatively hawkishly. And some of the inflation data that the Fed is evaluating, and especially in the stickiest parts of inflation, you think about the services and, and specifically within shelter costs and perhaps energy, areas where the Fed doesn't necessarily have a lever to pull or control, at least most immediately here. Should they be over-indexing in other areas of the data that they're evaluating then? Yeah, I mean, so when I talk about the February data, um, it wasn't that the headline print was necessarily out of consensus. Sure. It was really some of those components. And when you start looking at how the print um, you know, looked on, on some of these various uh, uh, subcomponents, for one, we, we did see the diffusion index still going up. So it just means the number of categories that are seeing some type of inflation is still going up. So it's broadening out. Um, the other thing is the super core, as they call it, which you know, is that services X housing. And, it did come back from that very, very high print um, in January, but it's still at a very elevated level. So I, I think that um, is something that at least gives the Fed a little bit of pause. We, al we always kind of knew that goods prices were going to start, the disinflation that we were seeing there was going to start slowing. That drove a lot of what we got in 2023. And the Fed kind of understood, markets understood, that that's going to slow down. And really, the, the other side, services, is going to have to start picking up and giving us more of that disinflationary pressure. Um, and this, the prints we've gotten in the first two months of this year really did not show us that that's happening. Blake Quinn, RBC Capital Markets Head of U.S. Rates Strategy. Blake, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for joining us.
Well, EV maker Fisker is responding to the Wall Street Journal's article about its potential bankruptcy filing. The company saying it often works with outside advisors and that the company is focused on engaging in a strategic partnership with a large automaker. There you're seeing the statement from the company as well here. And one of the things that is noteworthy about just this year for Fisker and the timeline that we've seen, because this is also, this is also a company that needs to get back within, you know, in this cure period that the New York Stock Exchange has, needs to get back into the listing standards here. It's already received as of February 16th a delisting notice from the New York Stock Exchange for its stock price falling below a dollar. And so it needs to get back above that and maintain it for a period of time. Um, they also mentioned at the end of February, we're well aware that sentiment on EVs has seen brighter days and our own company has experienced growing pains. The confidence in the future of Fisker remaining strong, at least from the executive level, but at the same time, you got to wonder if this new model that they've started to put forward is going to be successful. January 31st, they signed their first ever dealer partner. January 1st, to kick off the year, they announced to the street that they've got this new business dealer partnership model. So a larger question of how much of a delta that actually passes through to the bottom line here and, and the revenues. This is a company that just started to generate revenues last year here. Yeah, I, the, there's so many, so much uncertainty surrounding Fisker and exactly what the future looks like. Yes, this would be a step in the right direction when they talk about the fact that they are in strategic talks with a larger automaker following the bankruptcy rumors, and that was triggered by a story in the journal earlier this week. But this company has got a long ways to go, right? An extremely competitive landscape, one that is in the midst of pricing wars that are already pressuring margins of players that have been within the space now for years and years and years. So a smaller, newer entrant into this category, you're going to need that scale in order to compete. And maybe you're not going for the Teslas, the GMs, the Ford, the Rivet that, that we have on our screen, but even just to stay relevant within this conversation, you need a larger player that would be willing uh, to help you out clearly with the cash wise and everything like that. So this would be a step in the right direction, but still, you've got a stock that's trading at 17 cents a I mean, share. It's, so. a, it's, a, it's after GM and Ford have already announced yep. that they were going to be pulling back on some of their own production in house after the homegrown efforts that they had put forward. So. Who's going to go out and make an acquisition is now the question for Fisker, a company that, as I kind of do some quick typing here, uh, has a valuation right now at this point, market cap of about $92 million. So, again, you know, not even a unicorn company, nowhere near a unicorn company at this point, a company that I believe that when it came public in this kind of de spac process here, had much more ambition because we saw a changing tide in the demand profile for EVs. But it's a larger question of who's going to feel confident purchasing this company after looking at the same environment and having to pull back on some of their own spending into this EV landscape at this juncture. All right, let's move on to our next story here. And we're sticking within the car space, Nissan and Honda. They are considering entering a strategic partnership to develop new EV technology to compete in the China dominant clean tech market. Now, according to statements by Honda's president made earlier today, the company's are entering into discussions or entered into discussions in mid-January and will decide if a joint venture is on the table for the future. The reason behind this is scale. And kind of going back to what we were just talking about with Fisker, although a totally different scenario and discussion that's playing out here between Nissan and Honda. But it gets to this a similar point, which is scale, right? And the ability to compete in what is already a very competitive landscape and within uh the recent statements that have been released, Nissan CEO saying that emerging players are very aggressive and are making inroads at incredible speed. We cannot win the competition as long as we stick to conventional wisdom and a traditional approach. So they're taking the non-traditional approach, a potential partnership here, in order to better position both of these companies to be able to capitalize and really attract some of that demand that's out there. Yeah, could be looking at a, a new major Japan-based partnership yeah. as well. Uh, and we'll see how that services the rest of the world here. You're taking a look at the stock price action over the past five days here on that far right, and then today's activity that has both of them up single-digit percentages. Well, coming up, we've got much more Yahoo Finance coming your way. Stick around.
NVIDIA's big AI conference, GTC, beginning on Monday, investors are clamoring for the latest news and product announcements that's going to come from the AI darling. NVIDIA shares have been on a roller coaster this week, are up though 70% since the start of the year. So what's to expect from the big event and next week? Let's bring in Stacey Raskin, Bernstein's Managing Director and Senior Analyst. Stacey, it's great to have you here. So there certainly is a lot of hype heading in to the big event on Monday. What are you expecting and how big of a catalyst? Yeah, so uh, there's gonna be a lot there. I, I, I mean, it's it's they haven't held one of these events in person in four years. And the last one they held it in, in, in person, certainly um, AI was not nearly as, as exciting and mainstream as I think it is today. So there is a, a lot of expectations going into this. The biggest piece of, I guess, incremental information that we're all looking for is details on NVIDIA's next generation products. The, the code name is Blackwell, uh, the product's called the B100. Um, and people are waiting to see, you know, how much better is it than the current stuff? Like, what is the timeline? Um, people want to see, um, you know, how like how big of an opportunity do they think overall? Like their 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 market can give them over the next like several years. And um, in in general, though, like there is the the hype is certainly there, right? I mean, you even mentioned like the stock selling off this week. I mean, there are like there there are fears that the hype is so much it just can't live up to it. Like people are worried about a sell the news like kind of event. And I'd say with these events in the past, we've seen both. I've I've seen uh, takes where um, it, it was a sell the news. And I've seen other ones where I, I think in, you know, in 2017, the stock was up 30%, like, like coming out of this meeting. So it's kind of been all over the place. I will say long story short though, it's going to be a very exciting event. I think there's going to be lots of details on, on this as well as like all the other parts of their businesses. Everybody who cares about AI it, it, in the slightest is going to be there. Um, I'll be there in person. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. You know, it's so interesting that you, you mentioned the risk of this being a potential sell the news event in the in the case that they don't come out with the, the Goldilocks type of tenor that's uh, really needed to get the stock potentially to $1,000. I mean, I think back to that old, you know, Nike ad where they did the whole Kobe system thing, success at success at success. That's essentially what NVIDIA has been experiencing. So is this the event that can get them to $1,000 a share if they say the right thing? I mean, look, I don't think anybody's going to walk out of this event feeling less bullish on AI and NVIDIA's opportunity than they felt going in, <laughs> right? That That's clear. Um, I, I, I fully expect them to sound very, very positive. I fully expect them to have very good things to say about their product roadmap and, and everything else that they're, that they're, that they're playing in. Um, look, the stock's up 70% year to date. It tripled last year, so and it's consolidated a little bit. I have no problem believing, though, that the stock can get to those kinds of levels, regardless of what happens like after after, after next week. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. But um, in, in long story short, like, like I said, nobody's going to walk out of these meetings feeling less positive ab about the stock and the company, I think, than they felt going in. Stacy, you have a price target of $1,000 for the stock. Do you think that at $1,000, we see this rumored split take place? And what does that do, at least at a psychological level, if we do see a split? <sighs> They did a split. Um, oh, I don't know. It was a couple of years back. I think this. I can't even remember. The stock was. I, I don't remember. Six hundred dollars, maybe four hundred dollars. I can't remember. But they did one before. They sort of attributed it back then to make it easier, like on the employees. You know, it's, yeah. some some people will, will will look at at splits as making it easier for retail to buy. I don't think it's that important. I mean, people can buy fractional shares today. It's more psychological than anything else. Yeah. I don't read that much into it. I actually don't care if they split the stock or not. Um, and I have no idea if they think it's a thousand dollars, if they'll feel like splitting it or not. It, it doesn't, in my mind, doesn't matter that much. I mean, but you know, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not one of the, uh, the investors like playing this thing on Reddit either. So I, I don't know. Yeah, Stacey, we did a quick Google search here. The four for one uh, split, what most recent was back in 2021. L well, let's talk about that upside because clearly you're a bull on NVIDIA right now. There's lots yeah. to talk about what is even going to stop this, if anything can stop it, before it gets to $3 trillion. What do you think that timeline looks like? Well, <laughs> so, I think it's important to think about the opportunity that's in front of them. And, 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 and remember, we are very, very early in the days of, of, of generative AI and, and large language models and everything else. And you can we, we've we've done the math on this. You can look at the amount of computing power that is required even to serve up the, the stuff that's already happening, and and it is massive, right? Um, and we're just scratching the surface on on what can be done with this, and we're still very early on in the days of developing business models. 
Jensen has already also talked about um, a broader trend toward accelerated computing, that the historical drivers of efficiency in the world's data centers, whether it was Moore's law or the shift from mainframes to standard x86 or, or virtualization or the move to the cloud or all that stuff, it's all done. You have to do something else if you want to keep driving efficiency and, and, and this sort of heterogeneous acceleration, offloading workloads to other types of silicon at much higher efficiencies is still going on. And Jensen has talked about, you know, there's a trillion dollars of installed data center infrastructure out there that is not accelerated, that over time will be. They actually think that number goes to two trillion. And if you sort of run through the math of what that could mean for how big this could get over the next call of five years or 10 years, I am convinced that in five years or 10 years, we will be talking about numbers for these guys that are materially higher than what we are talking about today. If you look at the current valuation, even on today's numbers, and the numbers are, are probably still headed higher, frankly, it's not that expensive. It's, it's in the mid thirties, like forward price to forward earnings. It is the cheapest of all the AI stocks. Um, and it's probably got the, the best like opportunity and, and product roadmap and runway in front of them of all of them. So again, I have no, I don't know when it hits three trillion, who, who knows, but I have no problem believing that as we go forward over time, it won't be a straight line, I'm sure, but but over time, I think we'll be talking about numbers and opportunities that are quite a bit bigger than even now what we're talking about today. You know, just lastly, while we've got you, Stacey, how does NVIDIA avoid becoming a political pawn this election season? Because well, they already are, probably, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean yeah. we, we've looked at, you know, the, clearly there are have been sanctions and export controls that have been put on, on their ability to sell in China. And, and at the current moment, they really can't sell very much of anything in, into China today. Like that, that's been cut off. They're developing new products um, that will come in below some of the performance thresholds and enable them to sell. But I mean, clearly al already their opportunity, unfortunately, in China is going to be a lot lower than it would have been otherwise. And I, I mean, you got to play the game by whatever the rules are. They'll have to do that. But and I think if you think a little more generally, AI, I, I think, is becoming much more of a sovereign uh, uh, effort. It is a national security issue, I, th I think, for any country. Um, the companies actually talked about, and we've actually started to see like various countries in the world start to talk about building their own AI infrastructure and AI clouds. Um, and that is something that I, I think actually will, will be a positive for them. Like, like you'll, you'll have sovereign entities that, that can buy this stuff and deploy this stuff. But clearly it's already a national security issue. I mean, that, that's, that's not new, it's, it's already here. Stacey Raskin, who is the Bernstein Managing Director and Senior Analyst, talking all things NVIDIA. We know you'll be, you'll be at the conference, yeah? I'll be there, you bet. All right, excellent. We, we expect some live tweeting or Xing or posting, whatever <laughs> we're calling it these days. Thanks so much, Stacey. You bet. Well, NVIDIA's GTC conference starts Monday. So what better way to get prepared than with a few facts about the company and its CEO, Jensen Huang, that you might not already know? First. Have you ever wondered where the company's name came from? Well, it started with the letters N and V. That's what three co-founders would label all their documents to signify next version. Eventually, the company was ready to have a name, so the three looked for four words out there using those two letters. They found the Latin word for envy and then named their company NVIDIA. And when it came to, to label the first graphic processing unit, NVIDIA held a Name That Chip contest in 1999. 12,000 users sent in names, and eventually GeForce was selected. Seven users received the GPU for participating there. And after that, you know, NVIDIA's stock continued to move higher, most notably as we think about going forward from here, what this means for the naming of future products, what the company does with different contests, I don't know, but that's one way they engaged users very early on. It is one way to engage users. It's also a great way to get, keep people very interested within your company. You mentioned the fact that the stock really started to take off. Well, once the stock hit $100 per share for the first time, Jensen Wong actually got a tattoo designed around the company's logo. Talking about going all in. Tatted. On your company logo, and it's paying off right now. He should have to get a new tattoo <laughs> every time they eclipse a new $100 marker and the stock goes up yeah, by that increment. He has a lot increment. of tattoos. He'd have he, full, yeah. Yeah, full, yeah, full, yeah. Full sleeve, depending especially, on how large those tattoos are. Especially considering the splits. Well, anyway, <laughs> passion for chips runs in the family. Jensen Wong's children currently work at NVIDIA. And get this. Lisa Su, AMD CEO, is Jensen Huang's first cousin once removed. Uh, invite me to the barbecue, folks. <laughs> I'm just trying to slide through. I'll bring some good food. I know. Well, it's probably going to be one heck of a fancy barbecue if we're talking about that there. But I mean, th clearly, though, you were talking about the fact that it runs in the family. There is a lot of excitement surrounding 
the chip sector, what exactly NVIDIA has done to really revolutionize that AMD, obviously, under Lisa Sue. So just another fun fact. I never knew that, actually, until you just said it. Yeah, the chip bowl looks different at that family barbecue for sure here. Ha <laughs> ha, but up. All right, anyway. <laughs> coming up, everyone, Todd McKinnon, Octa CEO. Got to get myself out of that one. Todd McKinnon, Octa CEO, joining us next. Companies across industries continue to navigate challenges of ransomware attacks. Just this year, Russian-backed attackers have targeted two major companies, United Health Group's Change Healthcare and tech titan Microsoft. For more on the rise in cybercrime, we're joined by Todd McKinnon, who is the Okta co-founder and chief executive officer. Todd, great to speak with you as always and, and scratch, uh, well, get some time with you. Uh, you know, first and foremost, what, what is really prompting this rise in cyber attacks that we're seeing and additional threats? Well, as we, as an industry and an economy and a society move more and more information and transactions online and reap the benefits of that and ease of use and productivity for our companies, that's also where the, that's also where the, uh, the bad guys can make money. And that's where they're going after these things. You, you, you mentioned a couple examples and it's where the money is, it's where the vulnerabilities are and that's where they're going. And that's what we have to do as an industry is defend that. So Todd, how do you defend that? How, how do you navigate what what is an escalation here within the landscape? And then also on the flip side, just what is that then doing for demand for your product? Do you think it would be a real uptick in demand? Well, the the cybersecurity industry as a whole is a is a large and growing industry. The the specific part of it we play in, which is called 
the identity management part of cybersecurity is even more important than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. And that's because as more things move online, the old technologies like firewalls and, and virtual private networks aren't going to cut it. You have to have a strong identity system. And when you look at these attacks, in fact, you mentioned a couple of examples, the Microsoft attack or the United Healthcare uh, Group attack, it, over 80% of them involve a, a compromised identity. So there's somewhere in that chain of attack, there's an account that's taken over, there's a, a insecure password that's used that the threat actors compromise and, and use that to either initially land the attack or to pro, uh, to promote the attack within, within the infrastructure. So identity is a big part of the defense, and that's why uh, we're so important to our customers stepping up, helping them defend themselves against these identity-based attacks. You know, Todd, when we think about how much we've all kind of leaned into two-factor authentication as we need more safety, how far away are we from now having to think about three-factor authentication? I think there's, I would, when you talk about identity-based attacks, I think the first challenge is, is knowing the breadth of the accounts and the identities companies have in their ecosystem. So when you're talking about a company's corporate IT environment, especially for a sizable company, anyone over you know a couple hundred employees, it's pretty daunting to know all of the systems and networks and SaaS applications and data centers and servers in those data centers, trying to get a catalog of it all and comprehensively ha have a, a way and an approach to manage all of that. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge, as you mentioned, is not only to make sure that there's the right types of authentication methods on those accounts, you know, making sure they're very secure, like the modern authentica authentication methods aren't passwords, it's things like biometrics. So you can just log into your system by using your fingerprint or your or, or a face ID. Um, passwords are really not the modern way to do it. They're, they're the most vulnerable, they're the most secure. So comprehensive knowledge of what you have in your ecosystem, and then the ability to put the right strong level of of checking that the person is who they say they are on each of those accounts. That's what identity management is, and that's why demand for our products is is high. And Todd, speaking about demand for your product, also scaling the business, you recently closed uh, one of your recent acquisitions. Talk to us just about how that then positions you for further long-term profitable growth and what that runway looks like for Okta. We're very excited about the product roadmap, and it's it's moving in the direction that that I just spoke about. So, uh, moving from from a, a platform that can comprehensively connect employees to all of their technology and customers to all all of the technology, whether it's a new mobile app or a website a company is building, moving more toward a a, a product suite and a platform that can have visibility into the, into the entire internal set of services and cloud servers and on-premise servers and manage all of the um, accounts in those servers and give the companies a comprehensive view of all potential identity-based threats across the environment. That's that's what we're looking to do, and that's what customers are responding with 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 a healthy demand in the environment. Hey, Todd, while we have you, uh, you know, we were able to speak with one of your industry uh, colleagues more broadly, a uh, CEO over at CrowdStrike, George Kurtz, and and we had to ask about this election season. And I wonder from your purview, the role that cybersecurity plays in global elections where you've got almost half of the world's population that it's expected to go to the polls and to the ballots. I mean, it's not just elections. I mean, it's, it's not just any time of year. It's, it's a constant thing now with so many more processes and workflows moving online. Uh, and we talk about not only the actual voting part of elections, which is not online yet in most cases, but a lot of the media and a lot of the influence of as voters go to the polls, what they, where they get their information, we're, uh, as an industry, we're, we're, we're really focused on making sure we know what authentic information is online. And a lot of that comes down to identity. How do you know is it a bot on X that's posting or is it a real person? How do you know um, where the actual content is coming from that is kind of supporting different candidates and supporting different causes? That's an identity problem and uh, both Okta and the industry can help make sure that those things are genuine and that uh, voters know what they're really, when they're learning about things, they know it's accurate and complete and they can make the right decisions at the polls. All right, Todd McKinnon, great to have you here. Okta's co-founder and chief executive officer. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you. Coming up, we've got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The saga over Boeing 737 MAX has been stealing headlines for years, and in January of this year, it issued to a boiling point here. But let's take a step back to how this story started. In August 2011, Boeing first unveiled the 737 MAX aircraft family, but the plan was to build on the success of the current 737 and next generation model. It was an update, not a new design. The maiden flight took place without a hitch, January 29, 2016. Well, fast forward to October 29, 2018, and catastrophe strikes. A line air operated 737 MAX 8 crashes shortly after takeoff, killing 189 people. Less than a year later, on March 10th of 2019, disaster strikes again. A MAX 8 flown by Ethiopian Airlines crashes, killing 157 people. Just three days after the second fatal incident, the FAA temporarily grounded all Boeing 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9 planes. High-profile investigations followed, and Boeing vowed to make the necessary changes. Now fast forward to this year and another major incident for the manufacturer. That's right. On January 5th, a fuselage panel blew out on an Alaska Airlines-operated MAX 9 shortly after departure from Portland, Oregon. The stunning images of a missing section of a plane shocked the world and put the company's issues into stark relief. Alaska temporarily grounded its fleet of MAX 9s as a result. And a day later, the FAA temporarily grounded some MAX 9 planes and called for inspections of the aircraft. It led to United Airlines grounding its entire fleets of Boeing 737 MAX 9s and also canceling dozens of flights. The FAA then launched a formal investigation into the Boeing 737 MAX 9. And just days after, Alaska Airlines CEO Ben Minicucci told NBC that the airline found, quote, some loose bolts on many Boeing 737 MAX 9s. He said, I'm more than frustrated and disappointed, and I'm angry, the CEO saying. On January 24th, the FAA cleared the 737 MAX 9 jets to fly, but halted production expansion. Boeing made the move to replace the head of the 737 MAX program just last month. And earlier this week, an FAA audit had actually found dozens of issues with the 737 MAX production. This won't be back to business as usual for Boeing. They must to commit to real and profound improvements, end quote, the FAA administrator Michael Whitaker saying in a statement. But does this story end with Boeing? Well, maybe not here. It doesn't because we saw the contagion effect from Boeing's issues this week. Southwest Airlines revealing that it will cut flying capacity for the full year just after United and Delta both announced deliveries of the MAX 10 jets could be delayed as late as 2027. Now with regulators, airlines and passengers all in the eye of the storm, where does Boeing go next? I'm going to take a look at the stock price reaction here because Boeing clearly under a bit of pressure with shares off just about 30 percent since the start of the year. You can see the movement to the downside here today trading just above 182 bucks a share. So we want to bring in Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. And Mike, where does Boeing go from here? We talk about the fact that the stock has been under a tremendous amount of pressure off 30 percent. Do you see more downside risk here in the near term for Boeing? Absolutely. Boeing has relegated itself into a second place, a distant second place behind Airbus with this entire fiasco with the MAX. Uh, this has been going on now for, what, four years, five years now? Uh, and again, a lot of it's oversight. We haven't had FAA oversight. So uh, well, this has to come into the program. But right now, Airbus probably is going to end up with about 350 to 400 more airplanes they wouldn't have had before simply because Boeing can't produce uh, and Boeing can't really maintain the confidence of the airline industry anymore. There has to be a complete change at the top of that organization. Because right now, I mean, Airbus, I guarantee you, they're looking at taking that 70 acres they got down in Mobile and expanding their factory. Because over the next five to six years, those Dash 10s that aren't going to airlines, they're going to be A321s. They're going to need that production capacity. Mike. Boeing kicking the tires on an acquisition of Spirit Aerosystems. Will that remediate any of the near-term problems and at least bring some of the production in-house in fully for Boeing after they had essentially split out that group and it became its own entity years back? Well, who cares really who owns the stock in Spirit? The fact is Boeing is its major, not only, but its major customer. Boeing should have been on top of that regardless of whether they own the air, the uh, entity or not. So this is just like a placebo. The fact is, we've got to stop kicking tires here and we've got to recognize 
that Boeing's problems are more than just one company. This is our biggest exporter. And right now today, it is relegating itself to a distant second behind the only other game in town, which is Airbus. So if they buy aero, aero systems or not, doesn't make any difference. We have to fix that. Plus, we have to fix the oversight. The FAA was on site this entire time. So uh, they're not particularly clean on this either, and they have to move their game up as well. And thanks so much for uh, for, for comprehending my uh, typo in spoken <laughs> form there in airlines versus aero systems. Um, uh, very two different spirits there, Mike. Uh, so appreciate that. You know, what is the new max head that steps into this role? What should be the day one priority for them? The day one priority has to clean up the... Uh, What's going on in, in, in manufacturing? Look, uh, as I pointed out, in an airline, if you fix an airplane, the mechanic has to fix it. You have to know who it is. He signs off or she signs off. Then an inspector comes in and signs off. What we found out now is that's not a, what Boeing was doing. They can't tell you who worked on that airplane that Alaska had the problem with. That is outrageous. An airline would get shut down for that. So what we have to have is now some really strong oversight, and the people at the top have to be held accountable, and that has not really been done yet. Throwing a guy under the bus doesn't fix the problem. Mike, are you confident that it's actually going to happen this time? People will be held accountable? I don't know. The FAA has not done a very good job of oversight up till now. Mm -hmm. Let's hope they do. Like I said, they're like Louis Renault in, in the movie Casablanca. They're shocked, shocked to find this is going on. They've been on site all this time, so they have to move their game up a whole lot more. The FAA, if I'm remembering correctly, they are budgeting for a considerable amount more for, for their own capital expenditures over the course of this year. They're looking at air traffic control. Where would you like to see the budget for the FAA really take into account what needs to be looked at in the, the, the factory production, the manufacturing processes that they do have people placed within for quality assurance checks? Yeah, the FAA is responsibilities are wide. There's no question about it. But the fact of the matter is they have oversight of what manufacturers are doing, what suppliers are doing, what overhaul facilities are doing. They got to move that game up. And boy, you want to get into foreign overhaul facilities, they got a whole lot of work to do. So, you know, one job I don't want is to be ahead of the FAA. But guess what? Someone's going to have to take that job and shake it like a dead chicken. <laughs> Mike, you've, you've listed out a long uh, list of improvements that Boeing should and needs to make here in order to win back the confidence. I'm curious, though, what, in your view, should be that number one priority? Right now, today, we know this. Oversight of Boeing has not been acceptable. That probably means oversight of a lot of overhaul facilities may not be acceptable. It may mean other areas of the FAA. So they got to clean up their game. Uh, you know, again, Boeing's responsible for this. But the FAA has to be our guy on site to make sure that we don't have any more of these MAX fiascos or these Alaska fiascos that we had. What are you going to be tracking, Mike, to understand what the mindset of the consumer is while they see headlines like this coming across? You know, it's getting dangerous. I mean, there, there was a period back in the 1960s when the Lockheed Electra started to fall out of the sky and people literally were calling airlines to see if I'm on an Electra or not. I don't think it'll get to that. But if this keeps going, because remember, if, the, if there's a Boeing airplane with so much as a laboratory that doesn't work, it hits the headlines as another Boeing problem. So Boeing is behind the curve here, but the real curve here is fixing this problem as quickly as we possibly can and having the FAA being able to assure us that they are on top of it, not now, but going into the future. All right. In our conversations with some of the booking sites, maybe we will have to ask them how many people are filtering based on that. That might give us a little bit of an indicator as well in the interim period. Mike Boyd, always a pleasure to speak with you. Get some of your insights. Boyd Group, international president. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Got it. We've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers and expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, Market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
Copper on the move to the upside this week, spiking to the highest level that we've seen for prices in nearly a year. And S. Frey has a closer look at the movement that we're seeing here to the upside in S. Yeah, Shauna, and we are seeing an 11-month high when it comes to copper futures. Let me show you on our Wi-Fi interactive. These futures are measured in pounds, and you can see uh, today's uh, action up more than 1.5%. Look, a lot of this rally that we're seeing year-to-date, copper is up more than 6%. Part of this has to do with a tightening in global mine supplies. Uh, a giant mine in Panama that shut down last year, worries of interruptions in Zambia as well. And then you have smelters in China that have been joining uh, forces to combat a drop in processing fees, basically short of a coordinated production cut. So all of this has been helping to drive up copper futures. And we are also seeing in the market some expectations that the Fed may be cutting rates in June, whether that comes to fruition or not, that also can be influencing uh, these copper futures. Now, mind you, even though we have seen a run up in prices recently, uh, you do have to be careful with what we're seeing with uh, some of the stockpiles which have been building. So there's some analysts are saying, if you don't see a reversal in the stockpiles and investors could be sort of questioning this recent rally. But investors that I've also, or analysts that I've also been talking to have been saying, look, copper is very much needed for the energy transition. It's a very volatile commodity, as we have seen, but there will be a lot more demand going forward with this transition, guys. All right. Yahoo Finance's own Inez Frey tracking all things copper for us today. Inez, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we're keeping tabs on the major averages here in the U.S. You've got some red on the screen, despite it being the 15th of March. And, of course, that is known to come at the midpoint of March and, of course, St. Paddy's Day as well. Uh, so we're taking a look at some red here, uh, not getting in the festive mode as we're down on the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. But, hey, some holiday cheer coming your way in the next hour as Rochelle Kufo, she's going to cover... We've got five hours market. to go. We've got some time on the board. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, Rochelle's going to do what she can to get the markets in the green here. Rochelle, the duty's on you. We'll see you later.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. A reality check on rate cuts. Lots of data for investors to digest this week. Hotter than expected CPI and PPI inflation prints and mixed consumer data to boot. With more breathing room for the Fed, we look at what could be the make or break moment for the markets next. Plus, Bitcoin backs away from record highs, about 30 days shy of the next crypto catalyst, the Bitcoin halving event. We'll have expert analysis on Bitcoin's moves and which altcoins could be shining next. And 2024 spring break spending is expected to top last year's. That's according to the TSA. We'll get expert insight on how to save your time, money and, of course, your sanity on top travel destinations in the US and abroad. But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at red across the board here, the Dow, it's still relatively flat, though, down about 60 points. The S&P 500, they're down about 0.4%, about 20 points. They were seeing tech, the laggard, energy, the strongest sector so far this morning. Looking at the Nasdaq, we're only seeing NVIDIA among the MAC7 in the green under some pressure today, taking the biggest losses. Keep in mind, though, the third Friday of every quarter, also known as triple witching, when we see stock options, index futures and index options maturing, so expect some volatility. Let's also check in on what we're seeing with the Treasury market as well. A week before we head into that FOMC meeting, we've got the five-year currently up about 0.7%, the 10-year also up about 0.4%, sitting at 432, and the longest term 30-year yield sitting relatively flat though at 444. Well, we got some mixed consumer data out this week. Consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan falling month over month, but February retail sales rebounding. So that's signaling something of a consumer that's staying strong despite higher costs. Our next guest thinks the consumer could make or break the market. To tell us more, we have Lisa Erickson from U.S. Bank Wealth Management Public Markets Group here joining us. Good to see you here. So as we try and get a, a gauge of the consumer here, especially since, you know, when the consumer is feeling confident and they want to spend more, that increases business activity. What are you seeing, though, from the consumer as we wrap up this very busy week of data here? Well, Rochelle, to your point, the consumer has really remained very resilient. And again, while uh, we had some decent retail sales, what we're really looking for going forward is how long that can maintain, because the consumer has really done quite an amazing job, really in the face of tightening monetary policy and elevated inflation. And when we look at subsectors of con uh, consumers, what we're seeing so far is that the lower income cohort is starting to show some signs of strain, but the middle and the affluent segments are holding their own. And so really that's causing this overall picture to remain solid so far. But again, even though we have the possibility here of the Fed looking at lowering rates here over the next few months, we wanna to continue to look at that horse race between, again, the environment and the lagged impact of past rate increases on the consumer. Indeed. And we're still seeing that working through the economy here. But as the consumer does continue to spend, that's also adding some pressure, uh, upswing on inflation as well there. So we did see now some people were hoping that this would be you know, the end of what we'd see. We were going to continue to see a downtrend uh, in inflation. That February data throwing a bit of a wrench in things here. How should investors be viewing it, though? Because we know that the Fed takes a three to six to 12 month look when they're looking at this inflation data. Well, certainly we don't want one month's numbers to throw us off, but the Fed has indicated, on the other hand, that they want to continue to see greater evidence of that disinflation trend continuing for them really to move from this tighter monetary policy uh, to possibly loosening. And so uh, the numbers as they come out month by month are important. And we got a little bit of mixed bag this week, to your point, the prints, both the consumer price index and the pr producer price index came in hotter than people expected. Uh, but we did see some cooling, for example, on the consumer price index and that services component, which really has had a lot of demand behind it. So, you know, we don't think necessarily that that disinflation trend is is past us, but we will want to continue to see the rate of progress because that is going to influence again when that Fed can loosen up. And so then in terms of some forward looking indicators or signs that you could look at as we're still in the middle of the month, but at the tail end of earnings season there, what is the earnings picture showing you about the economy ahead and how investors are feeling? Well, certainly uh, this last earnings uh, season really 
proved to continue that trend of companies managing both their top lines and their bottom lines very well. So coming into the season, we had expectations for about 3% sales growth and 1.4% earnings growth. And the actual end of season results were around um, 8% on that earnings growth number and 3.9% on that sales growth number. So really some quite nice beats. However, if you look behind the hood, what's really interesting is that companies were not offering a lot of guidance. They might have offered a little bit of guidance for this upcoming quarter, but very little in terms of the next year. So there's some hesitation on the part of companies to forecast what's going on. And so that is a caution point that we're going to want to watch. Uh, generally, we are uh, seeing from the bottom up that, again, companies seem to be managing their growth and their cost lines fairly well, but we want to watch that hesitation point going forward. And as some of your clients are looking at portfolio allocations there, how are they feeling about their balance with equities there? So we're still waiting to see a really meaningful broadening out of the rally that has been driven by big tech so far this year. We really are advising our clients to take more of a balanced view right now on the U.S. stock market. And it's really a lot of these factors that we've been discussing that are behind that view. Uh, again, the economy has really outperformed, I think, most investors' expectations. And while it's been slowing, again, has generally had higher prints than people would have expected. However, uh, just over the last few weeks, even this morning, for example, the Empire State Manufacturing Survey, they, they, we are starting to get some negative negative economic surprises increasingly on that economic data. So we want to, again, with this prolonged rate increase period that we have, see how long that, that growth story can continue to hang in there. So we've got that positive, solid, absolute result, but again, some signs of, of uh, you know, hesitation. And so again, we think staying at whatever your long-term allocation is to stocks really makes the most sense right now. And Lisa, I want to tap into fixed income as well, because we were expecting a bit of a bumpy ride this year. Um, what are the expectations for here and where do you see the key opportunities? Well, certainly fixed income has some really nice yields on it that it wouldn't have a couple of years ago. And so that's a nice cushion overall to the return picture. However, uh, what we've really seen uh, in the last several days this week, in fact, is uh, some increase in the yields, particularly on the back of those uh, hotter than inflation numbers. And when that happens, that can cause the underlying bond prices to decline. So offsetting some of the nice yields you're getting. And so that is a trend that we're going to want to continue to monitor. There's some key technical levels that if uh, bond yields, uh, you know, uh, violate those levels on the way up, it could just cause further rate increases. So right now we're in a stand pat mode on that fixed income piece. But again, we, we are keeping a close eye on that rise in yields that we've seen over the last few days. And we'll continue to track some of that volatility. Appreciate you joining us. Lisa Erickson from U.S. Bank Wealth Management Public Markets Group. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Well, the price of oil hitting a four-month high this week. This comes after the International Energy Agency forecasting a supply deficit through this year, changing its earlier surplus forecast. For more on this, we have our very own Yahoo Finance senior business reporter, Inez Ferrer. So, Inez, talk about some of the action that we're seeing here in terms of a combination of production cuts and what the demand picture is looking like. Yeah, Rochelle, well, let me start out with the International Energy Agency and OPEC don't agree on many things. But in this case, now the International Energy Agency is saying that there will be a deficit of oil this year. And part of that has to do with the OPEC plus production cuts, which the IEA anticipates will go through 2024. Right now, those production cuts are set through the second quarter of this year for now. Uh, so the IEA, again, revising its supply forecasts, now anticipating a deficit. And uh, the OPEC plus production cuts, by the way, are 2.2 million barrels per day. Also, the IEA revised its global demand growth upwards to 1.3 million barrels per day. All of this to say is that these are revisions which are bullish for oil prices. We have seen oil running up in the last few days. We're looking at Brent crude that's right now trading above $85 a barrel. We're also watching WTI that's around $81 a barrel, surpassing that $80 barrel, a very psychological level uh, for traders, for the industry 
as well. We have seen attacks on Russian refineries. That is very much impacting supplies because those Russian customers have to go elsewhere in the world to get their supplies. So all of this uh, boating, uh, it's, it's bullish for oil prices. And we are now seeing year to date, oil is up for Brent 15% for WTI, uh, that, that is. And for Brent crude, prices also up about 12%. Also, Rochelle, Keep in mind, the government the S has been refilling its SPR, so part of the reason as well why we have seen U.S. futures higher in the last few weeks as well. Indeed, starting to see uh, gas prices ticking up uh, as a result as well, so watch that at the pump. Appreciate And you, as they always, will continue very, uh, to. They will continue to in the yes. next few weeks. Unfortunately, right in time for tra the travel season. Thanks so much, it is. Thanks. All right, coming up, AI in the workplace, how companies are faring with introducing the latest AI technologies to their businesses. We'll break all of that down for you after the break. New details are reportedly emerging about the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services task force to oversee AI in healthcare. President Biden signed an executive order last year for the HHS and its agencies to assess AI before it goes to market. For more details, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Anjali Kamlani with the latest. Hey, Anj. Hey, Rochelle, that's right. We know that, of course, the recent cyber attack on United Healthcare subsidiary, as well as some concerns 
over United Health's use of AI has really prompted the federal government to take a closer look. Last year, as you mentioned, the signing of that order, and then now the task force coming to fruition with some goals in mind. They have about 12 months uh, from formation to provide more details. But as of right now, the agencies you see on your screen do have a few details of what they're looking at. The Office of National Coordinator, for example, which is in charge of the health IT infrastructure for hospitals, it says that it is now requiring these hospitals to disclose how AI maintenance is being used when they have interaction with the government. Meanwhile, the FDA already has rules in place for approving AI-based medical devices. We've seen that happening. They are really at the top um, of the uh, ladder, really, when it comes to getting ahead of the curve there. Meanwhile, the uh, overall department looking for ways that the ACA has rules against discrimination to possibly apply those um, in order to enforce better AI use, as well as the Medicare office. Uh, I mentioned last year, United really getting a slap on the wrist for denials from their Medicare Advantage based on AI. So that has prompted a rule on blocking the use of AI for these decisions on claims. And that could see sort of more widespread use across Medicare. So these are just some of the details Details that Healthcare Dive has reported out uh, this morning. And we know that, uh, of course, the work is still underway. But as we've seen, because of that recent cyber attack, all eyes are on this topic. And just as a point of an update, uh, United has said that Change Healthcare, the subsidiary that was attacked, is back online. Meanwhile, the federal budget is looking at helping hospitals with this process with 1.3 billion earmarked for updating and uh, getting to a sort of a baseline for security with cyber. So all told, those two things interacting, AI really getting ahead in healthcare, and then you have the cyber problem and concern being dealt with so that all things can move ahead more smoothly. So that's where things stand right now. And we'll, of course, update you as things progress. Certainly good to see an industry the size of that, getting that balance of both cybersecurity and AI sort of disruption and development as well. Great stuff. Appreciate you, our very own Anjali Kemlani. Well, what will the workforce look like when you integrate artificial intelligence with human ingenuity? Well, these are some of the themes the Society for Human Resources Management explored at their recent AI plus HI conference. Now, some companies risk falling behind. Their recent annual report says that only 12 percent of HR professionals and 15 percent of U.S. workers believe that their organization is effectively integrating AI into the workplace. With that in mind, let's bring in Johnny Taylor, Society for Human Resources Management CEO, to discuss more. Thank you for joining me this morning. So I know when Great we to tend see. to talk about AI and the workplace, sometimes for workers, there's, there's a lot of pushback, a lot of concern about sort of where this is going. But in, you, in this latest conference that you had, it was more about collaboration between the two. What are some of the key use cases that support this? So what we know, for example, and by the way, thank you for having me here. It's great to see you. Um, Keys, listen, in recruitment, number one, talent acquisition is the is the most um, often used application right now in AI. Let's face it, if you're in a hiring manager, if you're in human resources, you post an application, you get a thousand resumes. How can you reasonably go through the process of reviewing 1,000 resumes with high quality and looking for all of the right traits and skills in a candidate. So we're absolutely using it in recruiting and hiring and then learning and development increasingly, especially as we are forced to learn with all of the changes, new technologies, new approaches to doing business, we're using it to provide asynchronous fast, effective education and the performance management. Once you tell a person that they're not doing well or conversely that they're doing well in their job, how can we give them the tools to do better or continue performing better? So Johnny, then when companies are looking at either upskilling and retaining existing workers versus sort of bringing in you know, new workers who already have that AI training, how are they looking at those sorts of investments? Yeah, they're just that, they're investments. In times past, learning and development was really considered a perk for the employee. Now, and increasingly so, employers are acknowledging that this is an investment in their business. Because at the end of the day, people are, you know, an aggregation of, of, of businesses or an aggregation of their people. And so we're seeing it very much as an investment. It's a long-term investment. And it's a, at this point, one that we're going to have to do continuously. 
given the rapid changes that we see in technologies and tools, we know that it's not about you know helping someone acquire a bachelor's degree and then we're done or an MBA. We're gonna have to retrain, constantly cross-train, reskill employees because as the technologies of today are old tomorrow. Indeed. So with that in mind, obviously, AI is as good as the data that it's trained on. So how do we avoid some of the prior biases that we've seen in hiring and retention and how employees are judged and assessed? How do we get some of those biases out or perhaps at least fine tune what we get with an AI version or an AI collaborative version? Well, first of all, thank you. That is the best question I have to tell you because oftentimes the question is posed is, wow, it, aren't these technologies algorithms filled with bias? Well, yes, but I got to tell you, they're not any more biased. In fact, the data will tell you they are less biased than human beings. As wonderful as we are, we bring all of our conscious and oftentimes unconscious biases into the hiring process. For example, I have a position that's open as a hiring manager. I need it filled immediately. And the person who shows up the most qualified candidate is a pregnant woman. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I can't hire that person because she's not going to be able to, she's going to be out for a while. She may not be fully engaged when she returns because we know what happens with working mothers. In other words, all of our biases come into play. Yes, there is admittedly some bias in the technology, but what we have, the advantage that we have in the technologies, the AI, is that we can check for those biases and correct for them. The algorithms can be modified, and let me be clear, they can be modified a lot more easily than modifying and impacting and influencing bias in a human being. Now, obviously, that sort of transparency, you know, it can be a double-edged sword for some companies here. Are you seeing much optimism in terms of adopting some of these technologies and the pace that they're adopting them? Yes. Yeah, so pace, slow. Uh, let's face it. I tell folks the big date was November 29, 2022, when the world essentially was introduced to ChatGPT, the first of the generative AI tools that we, we know of. And what we know is it's not been that long. Like, in fact, it usually takes uh, the workplace and the workforce years to adopt, even to embrace the idea of adopting a technology. And I think this has been pretty quickly. I mean, in 15, 18 months or so, people have actually begun to embrace it and embrace it quickly. So it's coming. It's not as fast as we'd like it, but there is a learning curve. We start with employees have to embrace this. Every headline that you see talks about how AI will replace HI, human intelligence, or take people's jobs. Naturally, then, people will resist it and find problems with it. So that's been a big part of the adoption problem is that the narrative is that AI is coming for your job. So that's the opportunity that we have on the worker side, and we're doing a much better job at that now. Employees are afraid because I saw the Goldman Sachs headline, 300 million jobs will disappear or be significant significantly degraded as on account of, of AI. Why do you think people would naturally embrace that? No, oh, it's true. And I think a lot of the piece that ends up missing in that is some of these sort of repetitive tasks that AI you know, can do while people can perhaps take on other things as long as they have the, the skills and get upskilled to do that. Um, I do want to ask you some of the key trends. If you had to think of perhaps four key trends that are really going to dominate where we go with AI in the workplace and how corporations should be looking at it, what do you think is going to mark the future here? Number one is reskilling. We're going to have to, it's not enough to say to people, you need to embrace technology. We've got to show them how to do it. That's number one. Number two is a legislative environment. Uh, policymakers, as we saw in your last episode, are weighing in very heavily on this. And so we're going to see a lot of activity from a trend standpoint around what state and, and uh, federal government, uh, the state and federal government is going to do about uh, the adoption of AI. Uh, the third is it's going to happen fast. What we think we know uh, about AI today will absolutely be outdated in six months. So get ready. And, and then the fourth is employees, I think, ultimately are going to embrace it because of the point that you alluded to earlier. And that is, they're going to see there's good in this for me. Some of the mundane tasks, the parts of my job that I hated, it's going to take away and, and make me and free me up to either enjoy my job by doing things I want to do or have more free time outside of work. So those are the trends. People are going to adopt this. Government's going to weigh in very heavily. The technology is going to get better and faster. And, and ultimately, we are going to find an environment where AI, artificial intelligence, plus HI, human intelligence, are going to coexist to create the new ROI. So then, Johnny, for people who are wondering, in terms of the bottom line here, when you compare 
companies that are getting AI right and integrating it well, what would be the, the selling point here for companies who are saying, look, it's too expensive, I, I don't have the finances to upskill versus those that are really plowing ahead here? Well, it's the way of the world. AI, if, if you're not doing it, you will lose the game. I mean, that's the bottom line. These technologies are going to make us more efficient, more effective, uh, better at what we do, and they're going to improve the lives and the quality of the lives of our employees. So if you're not doing it, you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And it's not just the tech companies. Every industry is going to be impacted, and every job is going to be impacted by AI. Some more than others, but all of them will be impacted. And so get with it or lose the game. There you go. Get with it or lose the game. There's the ending you need right there. Appreciate you for joining me this morning. Johnny Taylor, Society for Human Resources Management CEO. Thank you for your time this morning. Be well. Thank you. Well, the House this week passing a bill that could potentially lead to a ban of ByteDance app TikTok. Now it faces a slower path in the Senate. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to give us those details. So, Rick, here we are, potentially Senate bound. What should we be expecting? Well, at this point, I'm comfortable saying that I don't think this is going to get through the Senate in 2024. Uh, and here's the reason. Um, there are 170 million Americans who use TikTok, something like 7 million businesses, tons of young people. President Biden desperately needs young people to vote for him in November. Uh, this is actually a vulnerability. Uh, and Democrats also control the Senate. So um, you know, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is a political animal the same way that uh, President Biden is a political animal. And I just don't see those two guys um, agreeing that the Senate will move this bill uh, and actually put it into place where Biden has to sign a bill that says he's going to ban TikTok unless uh, the Chinese owners um, sell the company to a non-Chinese entity. Um, I would remind people, as uh, I've been trying to do all week, that the main um, element of this bill is not to ban TikTok. It's to get the Chinese parent company, ByteDance, to sell it so that the owners uh, are not based in China. Um, that's the real target, but most of the headlines are around the ban because uh, that would be the punishment if uh, ByteDance does not sell TikTok. Um, it would be banned in the United States. So I just don't see any way we're going to get there in 2024. After 2024, uh, that might be a different story, but we would be starting over where it would have to pass the House again, uh, and then we'd restart the clock. And uh, if President Biden wins in November, maybe he would sign it after 2024. President Trump, for his part, tried to ban TikTok in 2020, but now he's changed his story and says maybe that's not such a good idea. So um, I think TikTok's going to be with us for a good long while. And Rick, as you mentioned there, obviously still a question of divestiture uh, to, you know, potentially to a, to a U.S. company. China has already said it will not support that, the Chinese government come out and saying that. But if it does get banned, though, where will the blame lie? Will it lie with President Biden, who said he's already going to sign the bill if it comes, or former President Trump, who said he wanted to leave it up to Congress and then also reversed roles as well, in fact, drawing more of his ire towards what he sees as a potential beneficiary, which would be Meta or Facebook? Yep. Um, I think it's pretty simple to answer that question. If this uh, legislation passes in 2024, and President Biden has said he would sign it, and I think he has said that because I think on the QT he knows that the Senate is not going to pass it. But if um, Biden signs this bill in 2024, he is going to be the guy everybody blames. Um, uh, even if a ban, I mean, a ban, if, if they try to enact a ban, it would go to court. It would It would take years to get through court in the meanwhile. TikTok would continue to operate. But that turmoil alone would um, be a giant political problem for Biden. I think it's already a political problem for Biden because on TikTok itself, you have a lot of the young people who post videos saying, why is Biden trying to uh, trying to ban TikTok, given that he has said he would sign the bill? So I think what's going to have to happen here, I think, number one, this bill is not going to go anywhere in the Senate this year. But I think Biden is also going to have to do something um, to uh, to indicate to TikToks, again, 170 million users. I mean, we're talking about uh, fewer than a million votes could decide the 2024 president, presidential election. So I think Biden's going to actually have to do something to reassure some of those people. And the last thing I would add, Rochelle, is um, Biden has, himself has started posting videos on TikTok. Uh, he started around the Super Bowl th this year. Uh, I've been looking through some of those videos this morning. There are like 70 videos there from the uh, Biden-Harris campaign. So Biden himself 
is one of the people who uses TikTok to reach uh, younger voters. So um, some mixed messaging here, and I would expect Biden to try to clear this up in coming weeks and months. Well, certainly, as you mentioned, millions of users on TikTok will be watching that decision. I appreciate you, as always, our very own Rick Newman. See you, Rochelle. See you. All right, coming up, Bitcoin prices slumping after hitting record highs this week, but altcoins might be your next big crypto bet. We'll give you all those details next. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers and expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, Market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. A roller coaster week for Bitcoin yet again. After nearing 74,000, thanks to spot ETF demand, the rally has cooled, at least for now. And as Bitcoin rallied and fell, the altcoins followed suit. To break down Bitcoin's moves and why altcoins should be your next crypto bet, Christopher Newhouse, Cumberland Labs DeFi analyst, is here. Thank you for joining me on this Friday. So I want to first set the scene with what we saw with Bitcoin's moves, because obviously 
As Bitcoin moves, we do tend to see uh, the other tokens follow. But Bitcoin and then hopes of a, a spot Ether ETF as well, really contributing to the rally here. What should we make of this pause that we're seeing? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me, Rochelle. Um, in terms of the kind of pause that we're looking at right now, um, I'd like to say that the things that we're looking for heading forward are going to be specific narratives. Um, you were seeing a lot of performance in these altcoins, a lot of these different layer ones, a lot of these narrative centric tokens outperforming the current market environment right now. Um, and from my perspective, sure, we've got this retracement, we've got a potential pause in the majors, but there are starting to be a lot of interest in specific altcoin narratives popping up. Um, I like to say that some of the altcoins that are, are super popular within the top 20 market cap, which first of all, is a feat in and of itself, the altcoins that are actually moving right now are in the top 20 market cap. These coins have billions of dollars worth of dollars invested in these coins right now. Um, Near, Avalanche, Ton, these are all that have their own very specific narrative behind them. And I think that that is what's driving the move right now for some of the alt altcoin outperformance. And I want to look at Filecoin, a, a coin that I'm watching here. What are some of the ways that you're seeing that outperform and, and what's really supporting it? Yeah, yeah. So Filecoin, I'd like to say, is part of the narrative that is known as decentralized physical infrastructure. And the physical infrastructure that is being decentralized by Filecoin is storage. Um, one of the hottest narratives I'd like to say in the traditional markets currently is going to be the, the AI narrative, right? And one of the biggest things that I'm keeping my eye on in the traditional markets is the NVIDIA AI conference next week. So the reason for performance, I'd like to say, for coins like Filecoin, Near, uh, render and some of these other more decentralized physical infrastructure tokens, they're actually all focused on decentralized compute, de decentralized storage. Um, so from my perspective from with Filecoin, uh, you know, kind of at the forefront there, they're focusing a little bit more on the storage. Um, so I'd like to say that anything to do with storage, decentralized compute, that makes sense as to why the outperformance has happened so suddenly and so recently. It's because of the hot AI narrative that's going on in the traditional markets and now being able to invest maybe globally um, I like to think about it from a different perspective here is if you're able to get access and exposure to traditional market narratives using the digital asset markets themselves, that's a more global market and more globally available. Um, for people you know, in different countries, being able to get access to pure AI exposure maybe through NVIDIA could be difficult, but being able to buy something like these tokens we've mentioned maybe gets access to the traditional narratives that are going on through the digital asset markets. And you raise an interesting point about there being two baskets when you're looking at some of these coins, narrative, as you mentioned, but also timing. What are some of the front runners there? Because obviously you could have something like, you know, Dogecoin popping up because Elon Musk is suggesting that potentially at some point, you know, see more of it uh, being able to be used uh, to buy Teslas at some point. Some of these you consider a blip. How do you really navigate those two baskets? Yeah, yeah. So from my perspective, crypto is a very narrative driven, attention driven economy, and it really depends on how you separate the verticals. So for something like meme coins, which are very hot and very interesting right now, I'd like to say that those meme coin driven investments investments are very uh, attention driven. Whereas for some of these other altcoins and layer ones within the top 20 market cap, I'd like to say that's more narrative driven. And in terms of thinking about timing, narratives are usually a longer duration of timing. Um, so being able to come up with what's gonna be hot in three months, what's gonna be hot in six months, what's gonna be hot in 12 months, that's something that's a little bit more narrative oriented and maybe some of these larger market cap altcoins and layer ones is going to be uh, focused on that. Whereas with the meme coins, it's very much so what's hot in the next seven days, what's hot in the next 14 days, maybe what's hot in two days. Um, and that's kind of just looking at price action, volatility, what's going on in those specific meme coins as well. So I'd like to separate the timing in terms of two baskets. Is it a long-term narrative that'll be here for a while or is it an attention-driven nar narrative um, that'll only be a, a flash in the pan? And of course, with that in mind, a lot of excitement still building behind a potential spot ether um, spot ETF, the SEC coming up against that deadline soon. What are the expectations there? Obviously, it is a little bit different. You have elements of things like staking in there that make it a little bit different from Bitcoin. How should investors be viewing that? Yeah, so from my perspective, um, it's a tailwind that is very interesting because if you, think, if you think about it from a relative value perspective, looking at Bitcoin, you just discussed how we hit new all-time highs this week and last week, whereas Ethereum, we haven't tested those levels yet. Um, so from my perspective, there is kind of this relative value trade that a lot of people are very interested in. Um, in terms of what I think could happen after a spot ETF if this is approved, I do think that, first of all, 
ETH may, uh, you know, be able to break new highs. But I also think that a lot of the focus on ETH, these layer twos, ETH literally just had an upgrade on its kind of on, on its blockchain network to reduce the cost of data availability. That made some of the layer two tokens a little bit more attractive. Um, so from my perspective, if a spot ETH ETF is to be approved, you can probably start to see maybe some profit taking, maybe some rotations. But in the long term, I think that that's going to be bullish for both ETH, Bitcoin, digital assets as a whole. Um, whenever I like to think of Bitcoin versus ETH, I think of whenever I think of ETH, I think of the technology. Um, there's a lot of different decentralized mm -hmm. applications, and there's a lot of things going on in the ecosystem of Ethereum and some of the other DeFi-oriented tokens. Um, that it's a it's a very different thing to think about. But I, I would like to say that you know if the spot ETF was to be approved, I do think that there's going to be more of these narrative-driven kind of rotations out of the majors and into some of the altcoins. I well, appreciate you taking the time to break that down for us. Christopher Newhouse, Cumberland Labs DeFi analyst. Thank you for your time this morning. Have a Thanks great day. Thanks so much. All right, coming up, we'll dive into the state of the travel industry as we hit the middle of spring break travel. More on that after the break. Well, we're nearly halfway through what the TSA is calling the busiest time for spring break travel. That's between the March 7th and March 25th. Now, they're seeing travel volumes nearly 6% higher than previous records from 2023. 
Now, Thursday saw over 2.56 million travelers screened alone, beating 2023's number of 2.48 million. Let's bring in Brian Kelly, the Points Guy founder, to discuss how Americans are traveling during spring bake amid high inflation. Good to always good to see you here, Brian. So, in terms of the smart ways that people should be paying for spring break travel, what are your top tips? Well, of course, I'm the points guy, so I'm going to tell you to use your points. Even if you're a last-minute booker, there are a lot of really good deals out there. American Airlines had a deal this week, 5,000 miles to some destinations. I just booked flights to London. Virgin Atlantic yesterday announced for the next six days, 50% off award flight bookings to London, even in their fancy upper class, which can be a great deal. So bottom line, if you've got points, use them, especially last minute. People don't realize that the airlines will open up those really low saver level awards if they have any open seats. So always look to use points. Yeah, certainly. Asking for a friend here on that uh, last minute uh, spring break travel planning there. Um, so great to know that there are still some deals available. Um, I also want to ask about the volume of travel that's expected this spring break travel season. Is that surprising given what we've seen with inflation? It's, it's interesting. You know, inflation's still rising, but uh, I just reviewed some kayak data that they actually have domestic fares down 3% year over year. And uh, uh, actually, it was eight down 8% for April, which I found shocking. But Americans are spending more in total on spring break because the share of international has gone up. You know, the airlines all beefed up their Caribbean and Latin American operations. Uh, so the share of domestic spring break trips is now going to international. And AAA has uh, international bookings up 20% this year. So Americans are traveling further away and spending more. Uh, and airfares have not continued to skyrocket like they were the last couple of years. They've kind of petered out, which is good news for consumers. So, Brian, let's talk about some of these destinations. So domestically, I mean, when you think of spring break, obviously, you're going to think of Florida, Miami, making it very clear they're not here for the spring break nonsense. Yeah. Unfortunately, Fort Lauderdale, they're really bearing the brunt of a lot of that. So talk about the spring break destinations and the sort of costs that we're seeing involved. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's the, the typical destinations, the Orlando, uh, Phoenix and Vegas are all really high. And what I would recommend to people, um, Google, if you're open to going somewhere in spring break last minute, there's a feature on Google Flights, which everyone needs to know about. So when you go to Google.com slash flights, you click the Explore tab. And what you can actually do is put in your home city and then you can just type in a region like Caribbean and certain dates, or you want to go for a week during a certain month. And what it'll do is it'll pull up a map where you can look at all the destinations and flight prices. And my biggest tip to save money is let the deal decide where you go. Uh, so if you see super cheap fares to a Caribbean island you've never been, try it out and save all that money. Instead of spending it on airfare, spend it on experiences. So it certainly pays to be uh, flexible, at least, uh, in, in your destinations there. Um, I do want to ask you about some of these costs, because there's, there's a cost for everything. It feels as if, you know, you have to put all your luggage in your pockets, essentially, to try and avoid some of these fees. What are some of the key fees that people can try and avoid and some techniques to get really get around them? Yeah, I mean, the, the check bag fees are going up across the board on airlines. And if you're checking bags these days, you might want to look into getting an airline co-brand, especially if you live in Atlanta, and you're flying Delta quite a bit, even a couple times a year, actually even once a year, you can get the Delta co-branded credit card that gives you free luggage for you and traveling companions. So for less than $100 in, an, in a credit card fee, you can get a huge sign-up bonus that's worth maybe $1,000 or more, plus free bags whenever you use that card. So I would encourage people to look at getting a co-branded credit card if you fly an airline. Um, also, you know, you want to bring on as much as you can on board. I One of my tricks is, I'm 6'7", so I'm huge, and I have this massive backpack that is literally the size of a suitcase that just sits on my back. Now, you do want to be mindful, in-cabin space is limited, so just make sure that uh, your carry-on can go under the seat in front of you, your personal item. You don't want to be uh, a hog of the overhead bin space, but uh, I think the biggest tip is just getting credit cards that will reimburse fees or get you free fees or on the plane earlier so your bag doesn't end up getting checked even when you try to carry on. So no point trying to smuggle it under your coat, looking like a ninja turtle with all your stuff there. You still have to be able to put your stuff in the, the, in the seat, overhead yeah. compartments or under the seat. Um, I do want to ask, the biggest mistake that you tend to see people making when they're sort of having this last minute panic of trying to book something 
and you know they're looking at the prices and they just look insane at the moment. What's the biggest mistake people make? Well, I think the biggest mistake, and I get it, if you're cost conscious, you're going to go with the cheapest flight you see in the search results. But as my dad told me when I was a kid, cheap is expensive, especially the low cost carriers. So not only are you not going to get carry on, so you need to look at the total cost of the trip. And also on those basic economy fares, I, I see it, I hear it every day on Instagram. I book basic economy, but now I need to switch my flight or I want to get a seat assignment. I can't believe I don't, or I'm not earning miles. So really understand when you just uh, shop based on price, you may end up paying more than getting what a premium economy fare would have been. So try to look at the big picture. Also, do not book tight connections. I repeat, do not book the 45 minute connection in Atlanta, because guess what? You're going to miss it. And guess what? The other flights during spring break are full. So saving 20 bucks with a tight connection and then you ruin and miss a day of your weekend long trip doesn't make sense. So, you know, try to avoid making simple mistakes like that to save a couple bucks. And then all of a sudden you realize I just ruined my vacation. Indeed, I do remember running through Chicago Midway saying, why, why, why did I do this? So <laughs> appreciate that very much. Always good to have you on Brian Kelly at the Point Sky Founder. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Me. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Stock buybacks are expected to rebound in 2024 after companies pulled back the year prior. Deutsche Bank forecasts the total amount of buybacks could rise to $1 trillion on an annualized basis. 
But what exactly is a stock buyback? Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills breaks that down for us. This earnings season isn't just about AI. Another big theme this cycle, stock buybacks, with Meta, BYD, Uber, and Stellantis all announcing share repurchases this quarter. So what are stock buybacks, and how should investors be thinking about them? A stock buyback is sort of what it sounds like, companies repurchasing some of the stock they issued from shareholders, and that reduces the amount of shares outstanding in the market. Meta recently approved $50 billion in buybacks, meaning the company announced its intention to purchase $50 billion worth of stock in itself. Now for investors, buybacks like this can be seen in different lights. On the one hand, it could be considered a bullish signal because it indicates that companies are willing to bet on their own success. The critics say that buybacks are just a way for companies to artificially inflate their own stock price. The chairman of BYD alluded to this, saying their potential $56 million buyback is meant to both enhance investor confidence and stabilize and improve company value. But to propose buybacks in the first place, companies have to have a pretty stable balance sheet. They need cash to buy their own shares. That's one reason behind investor speculation that NVIDIA could be ripe for buybacks given its pristine balance sheet. While buybacks can increase share values, some experts say the real focus should be on dividends, which provide a tangible increase in the underlying value of a holding. Like dividends, buybacks return company profits to shareholders, but very important here, investors have to pay capital gains taxes on dividends. Buybacks do not trigger that tax liability. All right, great breakdown there from our very own Madison Mills. Well, let's get your final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still looking at red across the board here. The Dow currently off, extending those losses, currently off about 138 points. The S&P 500 also down about 0.6% there, energy leading the charge, tech the laggard with consumer discretionary and, commer and communication services weighing on the S&P. Tech heavy Nasdaq though taking the biggest front so far, down about 150 points or almost 1% on the day. Of course, a busy week of data the markets are digesting and of course looking ahead next week to the FOMC meeting where we will hear more from the Federal Reserve on interest rates. Well that does it for now, I'm Rochelle Akufo, stay with us on Yahoo Finance and have a great weekend.